Alok, um, you're chairman and board member of Istakapaza and yeah. also from your green canvas. Yeah. And additionally, you're the book author of Achieving Successful Business Outcomes. That's right. It got released uh, three months ago by Taylor and Francis. Yeah. So I'm pleased to welcome you here all today. And we're going to talk about this, I would say, association between business and humanity. Um, but to give a little bit of, I would say, context to, to our audience, I think it's important to start with the basics. So I'm very naive and um, I like to first put the stage on and give a meaning what it means to have this association of business and humanity and what kind of perspectives it can offer in this I would say troubled times we are all living in. So the floor is yours. Who wants to start? Ladies first. Sahana will start. <laughs> Sahana, <Okay>. please. <laughs> yeah. So great question, Miguel. And I think it's it's of immense relevance, uh, like you said, in these troubled times, in these chaotic, uncertain, ambiguous times, and also. Because I believe, um, and we've all been experiencing this firsthand, that the narratives that our world, our businesses, our organizations, our socio-economic political structures are based on are collapsing. They're, I mean, they have collapsed. They have become obsolete and outdated. And this also means that the narratives that our current organizations and businesses operate from functioned very well for a period of time, 100 odd years, maybe 200 years, industrial era and all of that, till they don't function anymore. So when we base our businesses on those narratives, what we end up having are organizations that are hurting rather than healing. And what do I mean by that is like, you know, your topic is so evocative that business and humanity cannot be delinked. Business cannot be delinked from the impact it has on humanity and on all sentient beings and on this planet. But to really come into, you know, to really bring that impact that when I say impact, I mean, say regenerative impact, the the flourishing, the anti-fragility, the thrivability of it, we need different underlying narrative structures for, and and you know all of that. We need to operate from a different source of being as businesses, as organizations. And uh, we, uh, like I said, it's impossible to dealing humanity and we cannot have businesses focusing on the benefit of a few at the cost of many so yeah that those are my first thoughts thank you okay so if i understand i mean you're adding uh, a social or i would say sustainable dimension to the way we should do business sustainable Yes, definitely. Sustainable and I would say beyond sustainable. I would say regenerative. That, you know, brings thrivability, not only to a few, but to everyone. And not only focus, not only the shareholders and their profit, but to all stakeholders, including the planet, including all sentient beings impacted. So, so when I say humanity, I'm saying that it is based on a set of narratives and we have operated on a se series of narratives, right? Narratives that have brought us still here. But now as things melt down and as the, as the narratives collapse, we are kind of in an in-between space, a space between stories, liminal space, whatever you call it. And we have this beautiful opportunity to reimagine and reconstruct new narratives of how 
businesses can operate and become healing forces on this planet. Thank you. Gentlemen, does someone, one of you, wants to rebound of what Sahana said? Sorry, go ahead. Do, Hello, do, go do, ahead. Do oh, all right. I, 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 I'm absolutely fine with doing that. And I think <clears throat> never uh, in the history of whatever we have seen, uh, you know, 50, 60 years, uh, I, I, my age is around 50 something, but never have we seen so much of need for people to come together. And it's people, businesses, government. I think it's far beyond businesses alone. It's people, businesses, governments, uh, even countries, whatever. And the reason uh, is very simple. No one has the answers. This has never occurred before. Uh, differences from what happened 100 years, 200, 300 years, but no one has the answer. And, and let me pause here and, and, and you know, uh, let me define some of uh, why I'm saying this. So, you know, and, and all of us know what volatility means, right? That we spoke about it. But a simple definition is when things are changing so fast that you either don't have enough time or you don't have enough resources to respond. I mean, there's just not enough time or resources. Now, when you don't have time or resources, it stymies two things. It stymies the mechanism of making choice because you just don't have enough time to choose nor do you have enough things to choose from. And hence, it's time is also decision making, right? So what do you depend upon? You depend upon more upon trust, upon people, upon, uh, you know, on the ground decision making. You depend upon not just the leaders, just the business, but everyone in the chain together. And I give you a very simple example. I, you know, uh, I, I don't know whether you remember the Taj incident uh, where the terrorists had uh, uh, you know, they've taken over Taj uh, 2611. And I was speaking to uh, an NSG commander. Uh, and the reason why I bring this uh, example, it's very similar. I, I feel it is similar. And, and that's the way uh, we need to navigate ourselves out of it. And uh, I asked him, and this was for the book, I was doing some research. And I asked him, uh, uh, well, sir, what did you feel like when you stormed inside the Taj Hotel. He said there was, we didn't storm inside, we just walked inside. And you think that, uh, you know, it's like a movie. It wasn't. It was pitch dark. We had 45 minutes before we knew what was the layout of the, the, the hotel inside. We walk inside. We were eight of them. We were eight of us. We fanned out. There was no one to take this. There was no one to take orders from. There was no one to give orders to because he would give your way away. But the only driving force that we had was the direction in which we had to move. So the final objective was to neutralize the terrorists, get the get the uh, uh, the guests out. And we didn't even know how to separate those two. And a lot of it is gut. And, and, and this is where trust, this is where people working together uh, makes, makes a difference. And I think we are in a similar situation. I, I, and I would uh, expand from just businesses and humanity to uh, to countries to to you know governments businesses humanity everything else so that would be my opening uh, uh, input thank you alok uh i there are already so I, I would like to have the, the vantage point from from sunil first uh before we we take on board some of some of the questions so i think uh you guys have left me very little to say because I, I think you've covered almost everything. You chose. So, you anyway. chose until I gave you an offer. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, so I always I always challenge myself to, you know, be at the end to see if I really have something to say or I can say, well, it's already been covered and I don't need to say anything. <laughs> anyway, jokes aside, I think I'll pick up on two. Um, I, first of all, very happy to be here. Great to meet uh, Sahana and Alok. And Miguel, of course, we've met before uh, in the run-up to this. And Sahana talked about a narrative which is absolutely correct. The narrative has, has to change. It is not the same narrative anymore. And there's a very famous, uh, something I quite like, by uh, the founder of uh, an investment firm, I think, in the US called David. Uh, it's called Gus, and his name is David Rose. So he very famously has uh, pronounced a few years ago, that
that any business or organization that was designed for the 20th century is doomed to fail in the 21st which means it covers everything all institutions like alok pointed out you know governments etc but the uh, let me take a slightly different uh, track to see if if that will challenge us or not so first thing is that i think you know whatever we've done till now is a very industrial mechanistic world view that we've taken and our education systems are all designed to become actually uh, well trained for industrial output which means for factories as a result of which we become very lazy thinkers every human being on this planet i think is become very lazy and we prefer to be comfortable more than being happy so we really feel that okay if we are comfortable then even happiness is not not such a great uh, deal now that puts us into a very very funny position because you know then in that case you need a stable predictable world which we just, we know now while people have were waiting in january and february and march to say hey you know what this covid has come it's uh, it's a pandemic so what it's going to go away and we'll go back to normal there is no back to normal i think uh, sai has said this before and almost all of us who are on this panel are on the panel and all the people on this conference i mean i'll be preaching to the choir if i'm trying to you know tell people that this is what it's going to be all about so uh, i look at business and humanity very differently i look at hum this, uh, humanity very specifically as humanity can means actually two things to me one it means human kind and second it means how human am i you know the humanness the feeling the emotion of understanding not from just my brain which is the mechanistic world view but also with my whole being and that goes into sahana's point that you know we have to understand that we are a uh, part of an interconnected universe not only planet but the way we've uh, lived our lives it seems to most human beings i think uh, to some extent i think each of us is guilty for not having uh, done anything about it is that we believe that this planet is a bunch of resources for us to exploit for our own gain so the only way i would like to you know you know kick off this uh, discussion is to say that can we think do two things one is that let's instead of trying to just look at everything outside in all the inputs that we get how does business work these are all things that we that force us to react because we are coming you using only our uh, the five senses and what happens is that what you hear or what you see you kind of start reacting to it so first according to me and this is what i've been trying to practice for, uh, over the last 3 or 4 months is Have, when was the last time i said hello to myself can we first get in touch with ourselves to first understand and not run away from the fact that you know it's too scary to know who i am you know can i can i understand who i am and then how do i fit into this large jigsaw puzzle that we call the planet or the earth because if we don't do that then we are still going to be doing things reactively and in a problem solving sort of a way rather than a problem finding kind of a way and the other provocation i have before i sign off from this particular piece is we have looted this planet and everything from a future generation can we all pledge that we give it back to them so whether it's leadership or whatever it is can we just hand it over back to them because we've made a huge mess out of it and done thank you thank you very much sena uh when when listening to you and and looking at what's coming on on the chat um i think we have different levels um uh, of of encountering uh, i would say modern nature and our conscious uh conscious humanity we have the individual level we have the team level the organizational level and the society um what comes to your mind in terms of example of organization that came across this transition uh from the i would say old narrative to 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 the new ones do you have some example of initiatives of i would say current transitions or i would say already success, successful steps uh at the level of organizations and this question is directed to all anyone can take it it's a free for all alok you can take it so <laughs> sure, we are free I'm... raise your hand <laughs> okay <I'll do> <laughs> please alok 
So, so uh, you know, uh, over three decades being in the technology industry, my, you know, part of my brain does work like that, but my heart doesn't work like that. So uh, the book that I've written is about a model which is called the time, space, and action model. And I won't go into the details of that. Basically, uh, space is like the market. Uh, what, what Space defines market or organizational strength or anyone's strength. Okay, So you have own, known, and unknown spaces. And I'll stop over there. Uh, I won't go into time and action because it's really not necessary at the point. But remember, whenever disruptions occur, they occur from the unknown. And, and we keep talking about the fact that today's disruption is very diff different from the dif disruptions that we have seen before, right? Uh, and the reason is very simple. Uh, all the disruptions that have occurred before are either in your own or in, in the known territories. When I say own, this is the sphere where you operate, your markets where you operate. So, you know, you can have a disruption which is supply chain disruption or known which is a dis disruption which is to an adjacent place uh, adjacent market where you have uh, your your, your uh, partners, but they are usually disruptions which are which are within the own own spaces or known spaces, and they are governed, they are controlled. Uh, you know, if if, they, if someone's gone beyond the precinct of what natural competition means, uh, well, the government will step in and 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 put in mechanism by which they are disallowed. But this is the first sign when the disruption has occurred from unknown. Okay, the enemy is unknown. This is an unknown disruption. No one has any control. Who knew planes will be grounded or anything, right? Now, how do you fight a disruption from unknown? So at any point in time when the enemy, and, and I call this little virus as the enemy, and it could be not only the little virus, but there are a lot of other things, degradation in culture, degradation in closeness, humanness, that there are hundred things I can bring in, and, and I do have something. But uh, when the, the enemy is hidden, unknown, there's no way you can fight the enemy. So the best way to fight the enemy is to bring the enemy to known territory and fight. Well, at the same time, keep protecting whatever you 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 own. Now, this is uh, this is a very credible normal response. So, what do the governments do? The governments impose lockdown and impose social distancing. Why did they do it? Because they wanted to isolate the afflicted and then hope in hell that you know they had got the complete set and and the non-afflicted they can separate. Uh, and, and, you know, a very sad thing happened in India. Uh, because we had sustained lockdown for nearly two, two months, uh, the smaller uh, entities, the smaller organizations refused to pay salaries and money to, to their employees. And, and these were employees who were from outside the state. Now, what did they do? Since they were living in a city which was heartless outside of where their villages were, no money being, you know, pressurized by the landlords pressed for food, for whatever. Some of them walked a thousand miles, some even 1500 miles over a period of 30 days and not, there were not one or two, they were in thousands and thousands who walked. And what were they doing? They were going to a point which was un from unknown to known and then they were trying to fight. Now they're coming back again. But what I'm trying to say is uh, the reason there is a difference, the reason there is a change is because we've never been attacked from the unknown. This is the first time we've been attacked from the unknown. And uh, the governments are only perpetuating the problem. So they want to kickstart the economy. Guess where the, where the money is getting invested in or where the money is flowing into everything which is related to fossil fuels, right? They're, they're not talking about green. So in fact, what has happened because of this pandemic, we have pushed even further uh, if we talk about environment. Uh, that would be my first reaction. Uh, okay, so basically I would say that this transition is certainly at the very, very early beginning. And uh, we see, I would see, few successful initiatives, probably just, I would say, kick, kick, kickoffs uh, here and there. But as the way the economy is, is shaped, it's, 
it looks like almost a paradox between those two words. Are they really coming together? Uh, see, it sounds difficult to have business or I would say economy and humanity coming together at this point. Actually, uh, this, this impression, this, this first impression gives me the feeling that the economy is destroying part of humanity. Um, Sunil, I think you wanted to add something. Um, uh, see, I'm, I'm not sure that businesses know which game we are playing right now. I think we are still using the old rules. Uh, uh, Alok is absolutely right. I can give you a quick example that comes to mind about so because your question was mostly about do you know of any organizations that have used the existing or the new narrative and found success with it. So yeah, let and me see apparently if I, I can't. Yeah, so so I think see if you look at it, most of the new businesses that we have seen that have actually been not most, many of the new businesses that have actually become unicorns in the last maybe four or five years. Uh, the asset light businesses, we all know about it because uh, Singularity University has actually popularized all those business models. Uh, many of them have uh, actually tried to walk that talk because they've, see the focus cannot be just shareholder value. The focus, And I think that's the narrative that most of us have uh, are trying to beat right now to say that you cannot just focus on one shareholder in a business. Uh, one stakeholder in a business. It can't be just shareholder value, shareholder value, shareholder value. Because then what happens is that you're going to keep going back into a short term way of looking at everything. And short term doesn't feed the long term, however much we may like it. So if you take a systems thinking sort of an approach, what you find is that the sum of the parts do not, I'm sorry about the cliche, but the sum of the parts do not become the whole. So let me give you an example. See, what happens is that we kept, keep expecting that the government is going to come in with policy and regulation and make sure that, again, I come back to my point about we, we are much prefer being comfortable than being happy. So we don't want to stretch ourselves. I'll give you a, a small, short story if I have the permission. You know, Miami Airport, at one point of time, the taxi union in Miami Airport decided that Uber was a big threat to them. And so the taxi union came into Miami Airport and said, sorry, we are not going to let uh, passengers order Ubers. And if they order Ubers, we will not let Ubers come and pick up passengers from Miami Airport. All right. And so you said, fine. Uh, in, a, in the old world, I mean, that taxi union was all powerful. You probably would have find, found Uber not existing any longer. But what did Uber do, actually? If you go back to the history of Uber, Uber did not wait for regulation or did not come to the government and say, you know what, I want to try this thing out and I can use technology. They did something which I would term as illegal. They said, we will not take any permits. We are, we are not going to go and register ourselves. We will simply use technology because we believe that the world needs something that technology can enable, right? And to cut a long story short, what actually ended up happening was passengers stopped flying into Miami airport. If you look at America, if you look at the culture, right? People just need to buy, uh, uh, rent a car from the airport and go wherever they want to. So what they started doing was all passengers who wanted to fly into Miami started flying into Fort Lauderdale, right? So what's happening is with technology having reached where it has reached and the, the accelerating technology is parallelly that we see going in uh, right in front of us. You look at robotics, you look at biotechnology, the whole genome project. What's happening is that this technology is doing many, many things to empower individuals, which are citizens, which means this whole role for the government and regulation is completely gone. So I have a lot of hope saying that, you know, when you democratize this and you hand over power into the hands of the citizens, right, then the government better shape up or they have to ship out. So you can see Uber, you can see Airbnb. These I'm not I'm not saying that they are very ethical companies. But if you look at even everybody's narrative today, we are saying, well, that single bottom line of profit is not OK. So we must have a triple bottom line. So what is the triple bottom line? It is it is profit, it's people, it's planet. But people forget that the order is very important. It has to be planet before people, before profit. So if you have all the three as a triple bottom line, but you flip it over and you say profit and then people and planet, 
we are going to be in a much bigger mess because technology is going to enable those things much much quicker are you getting what i'm saying so regulation is not regulation is dead you look at all our institutions are broken you look at politics it's broken you look at education it's broken you look at uh, banks they are broken you look at insurance it's broken uh, countries are completely broken which form of pol politics is working today earlier uh, it was capitalism versus communism nothing works anymore right so maybe we are talking about the end of the nation state but are we willing to think of those kind of things or we just look at it and say well it's never happened in the last 150 years my mind can't uh, understand it so that's not reality and i think that is where we've landed ourselves today i'm sorry this became a little longer i'll keep myself short the next time you're always welcome sunay uh sahana do, do you want to 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 add something to 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 what sunil said because i understand that it's very difficult for organizations today to shift this order of priorities yeah i'll i'll take it from a slightly different angle adding to what sunil said and adding to what the question that was asked about is there any example of an organization that is operating or at least beginning to operate from a different narrative or a different set of values so reinventing organizations by frederick lalu has examples of you know different organizations which are stepping into what he calls the teal paradigm i won't go into the details of the teal paradigm people interested can definitely read the book it's immensely readable there is also an illustrated version of it but i'm going to just cite an example of budzog the nursing company which switched to this whole structure of productivity efficiency division of labor uh, using technology to you know absolutely minutely to the second time that each nurse would spend with each visitor as in each client uh, each patient each customer and what ended up happening was nurses were being treated like robots the client wasn't getting the care they needed because the human connection was lost and technology and like sunil said if we are basing technology on the wrong narrative we end up exaggerating its failures its you know negativity so this is exactly what happened and one of the nurses chosti block a senior nurse he stepped he kind of you know went through this whole experience and said this is not happening nurses are not here to become robots and cogs in a machine and he set up this agency budzog agency where he formed nurses into little pods of 10 to 12 nurses each and gave them absolute freedom which is you know self management self organization horizontal organization whatever you would like to call it let them use the power of technology and the network and decide how they would take on their area and their patients today they have 9000 plus nurses they have saved and i'm forgetting the exact number anyone interested can look up they have saved the healthcare 50% of the insurance that they had to pay out because the way they treat patients they make patients independent patients are healing faster the connection is stronger they are creating a community for the patients so what happened here is they stepped into a different narrative of self organization of true care of wholeness and shifted the use of technology into a more um i would say a more holistic paradigm so today if something is not working then the ceo actually writes a blog post to which everyone responds and there is if they want to refute they refute they don't have to agree with him at all and that's how decisions have moved faster so there is use of technology but not in a restricted linear sense in a much more holistic sense so yeah so that's one of the examples of an organization creating a different paradigm even in you know even in the middle of this chaos yeah so can i can i give a small rejoinder yes for sure yeah. i think we are again going to the the examples of uh, pre covid potentially uh, i'm not, so and we shouldn't even leave uh, this panel with a feeling of despondence that nothing is happening no it is happening uh, it's not that it's not happening it is happening i run a, a show called guts glory and story where i get uh, global ceos and they talk about it 
Now, I can tell you, in, but they're happening in small ways. And, and I give you how. So, for example, and these are strange problems with strange countries. I mean, the, one of them is ours. So, for example, people, uh, people in Bombay who are taking work from home, uh, uh, w, work from home calls, they had enough people in the house uh, not moving out and they didn't have space. So they were taking calls from the cars because there's no space. And the seniors are feeling, you know, embarrassed getting, getting them on them. So the work from home uh, narrative has changed completely. They are giving, you know, spaces and, and furniture right at the corner of a room, which they can try and isolate them, themselves. You know, the, the, there is a newer class of employees that seem to have surfaced. That is the, that is the plus point, okay, which is... Uh, earlier, uh, especially moms, uh, there were some, uh, uh, you know, men also, especially moms were tending to their kids, you know, at home. Today, since the moms are at home and their spouses are at home, they can share jobs. And by the way, organizations are hiring critical, you know, moms who had, who had left active job, but they can now work because it's no more what it is. I can also tell you the fact that, you know, there are a number of countries, they give uh, discounts or tax breaks if you are working from a certain economic zone. Now, if, if people are working from home, you're losing taxes, but the companies are actually weighing whether losing taxes are better or whether it is better to have enabled A-class, highly motivated workforce, you'll be surprised. People want to keep A-class, highly motivated workforce, but not pay taxes. But these are real. I'm it's, so I'm not saying that everything is wrong. But what I'm saying is the cases are new. The old cases don't stand uh, or may not stand because today the number of patients that come in the hospital are so high. The hospitals have to turn people out. They have to, you know, they have to identify. And this has happened in... In Europe, they have to identify if he's an old guy, has lived his life, he's thrown out, I mean, not thrown out, but he's sent out, whereas a young guy is brought in. Those are the choices, those are the decisions being made. And this is a hard world. I mean, we are sitting on a panel and talking about it. This is a hard world, and this, everyone's going through some very tough time. But there are green groups, that's all I want to say. Thank you, Alok. Uh, we only have five minutes left um, before closing this panel conversation. I just want to ask you, uh, as it is, I would say, an emerging um, set of initiatives happening around the world due to this pandemic, um, can you, as a conclusion, uh, probably give us an idea of what are the obstacles that we need to overcome, the hurdles that we need to fight against to make it happen? What do the leaders of today need to do to make this happen and avoid getting worse if they want to preserve humanity in their business? So I think it's um, first, I think it's absolutely critical for today's leaders to befriend uncertainty. I mean, if you look at, quote unquote, traditional leadership, leaders are the solution providers. They are the ones who delegate. They are the ones who decide. They are the ones who lay down the path. They are the ones who, lay, uh, you know, sort of define the roadmap and people follow orders. But like we, I mean, we won't even go into it, but like we know that we are in, an, in this extremely fluid, ambiguous, uncertain world, leaders have to really step into this uncertainty not try to turn uncertainty into um pos you know into uh, i would say forced certainty but stay stay in it stay with the questions stay with uncertainty and not uh, and and this is going back to something that sunil said earlier that you know it is not only about holding space for others it's about holding space for themselves for each one of us if leaders can hold space for himself or herself, then they can hold space for others. And I think stepping into uncertainty and holding that space, uh, embodying facilitative leadership 
is going to be key, one of the keys. That's my, my piece. Thank you, Sahana. Uh, very rapidly, a last thought, because we are running out of time and this conversation is absolutely fascinating. Um, does one of you gentlemen wants to add something for closing? Yeah, I can do that. Yeah, so, so, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, please, please. Sorry. No, no, I look after you, after you. You, you, please go ahead. We'll waste that. Go ahead, go ahead, please. Okay, so uh, I think Alok did the absolutely the right thing by saying, let's not leave this panel on a negative note. Let's do it on a positive note. And so I don't think uh, we should be talking too much about obstacles because like he also pointed out this, we've already stepped into something which we've never seen before, right? So with taking COVID into account, let's not look at the obstacles because the obstacles are all uh, projections of the past. They're not opportunities into the future, right? So. Uh, if you, I think what I will do is I will just read a small little thing about Nelson Mandela, about his role, uh, about leadership. So we we all have this feeling, and people have heard this that we great. That's great, but I will repeat it anyway. Uh, Nelson Mandela, one of the world's best known leaders, most resilient leaders, says, "The image of the shepherd behind his flock is an acknowledgement that leadership is a collective activity in which different people at different times, depending on their strengths or nimbleness, come forward to move the group in the direction it needs to go." The metaphor also hints at the agility of a group that doesn't have to wait for and then respond to a command from the front. That kind of agility is more likely to be developed by a group when a leader conceives of her role as creating the opportunity for collective leadership as opposed to merely setting direction. So I found this exceptionally powerful and relevant going into the future because we've always heard the rhetoric of lead from the front. And Nelson Mandela said, it's better to lead from behind, you know, because then you have a view of what's, what's going on. I thought that was very powerful and a way to go into the future. And before I finish, I uh, noticed that Kevin has asked a question, Kevin Thomas, uh, is it really true that people don't want to stretch themselves? Uh, it, it was a generalization, I must apologize, Kevin, but yes, in the business uh, space, typically that's true because we keep hiding behind the rule book, we keep hiding behind policy, we keep waiting for leaders to tell us what to do. In, that's what uh, my context was in saying people prefer being comfortable than happy. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Alok. Th thanks, thank Anna. you very much. Thanks, Miguel. Thank you very much. This will be the, the last word for, for our panel today. I wish to thank you all. Thank you very much, Sahana. Thank you, Sunil. Thank you, thank Alok. You. Uh, and a special thanks to, to Lenny Tessier, who supported us uh, for the production part. Thank you. See you soon. I hope this conversation will be fruitful uh, for the future of us all. Bye. Bye. Bye.
Hey, hey. Ha, ha. Very good morning. Ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Catalyzing the Future. Today's conversation is about risk and uncertainty. And when I say conversation, it's purely conversation with no format. It's going to be fluid, dynamic, more importantly, thought-provoking conversations. A little about me. I'm John Sherian. I work as a business coach. I work with organizations, leaders, teams, more importantly, with people. I, I partner with people to ensure that they get the best out of themselves to ensure that it's not just for their benefit, for the organization, and more importantly, for humanity around. I can go on and on talking about myself. I love to talk about myself, but that's not what we're here for. Ladies and gentlemen, let's start diving into the conversation. Before we get in there, I request our panelists to briefly introduce themselves and then give us a perspective and dive into the conversation from then on. Let the conversation unfold. Who wants to go first? Silent. Okay. No volunteers. I, I guess I'll choose to go first and, and, and be rude to the ladies. Uh, I'm Gary Sickich, and I have a consulting practice called Logical Management Systems. Um, it's been in business since the 80s. I primarily focus on working with companies on risk, crisis management, business continuity, uh, business simulations, and general consulting services. Um, what I'm going to talk about will be uh, some aspects of risk that I look at as how we need to rethink and begin to start to look at risk uh, from a different perspective. So the fact that risk isn't static, the fact that risk probes for uncertainties, the fact that we tend to be reactive towards risk and that we need to rethink how we're looking at all the mitigation efforts we apply towards risk. Um, and that kind of summarizes me. You can find me on LinkedIn and various other places on the internet. Um, hopefully all of them will be really good sites, not really <laughs> scary sites. So I'll turn it over to the next of our speakers. Rika, do you want to? Yeah, wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. I just forgot to unmute myself before <laughs> technology. So yeah, I'm Rike, Rike Petzold from, from Germany, Munich, um, where I also am right now. Um, first of all, thank you, Sai, for inviting me on. Uh, my topic I'm very, very passionate about, well, amongst others, is uncertainty and how to deal with uncertainty. Um, quickly about my background. So I have a background in Chinese and Japanese studies and in language philosophy. And for years, I have worked and supported companies and institutions in how to deal with um, East Asia. And what I realized through my work was that it's not really that helpful to just focus on the strangeness of the other but it's much more important and much more helpful to, to look at ourselves and our comfort zones and our attitudes and our expectations. And from like coming from there, I realized that it's very similar, like regarding a different culture, yes, but also regarding the unknown and uncertainty. And that was the one thing. And the other thing was like my personal affinity to uncertain situations. So I was personally always very, very attracted to newness to openness to situations with uncertain outcomes and these two things came together like a couple of years ago and um, sort of I pulled together my my findings from my professional experience and um, together with my personal interest and became really immersed in this whole topic of complexity and emergence and uncertainty and this is what I'm like I've been doing for the last couple of years sort of support other support companies, support institutions in finding ways how to deal with the unknown, how to deal with uncertainty. And you can also find me on LinkedIn and on various platforms. I know this is also very good. <laughs> I'm very happy to be here. Sarah. Thank you, Rika. 
Um, hi, so I'm Sarah Robertson. I'm a founder of uh, my own consultancy. It's called Lime Horse, and so I um, focus on uh, professional development. Uh, basically mostly delivered in e-learning and focusing on the legal profession. I'm also a faculty and advisory board member at University of Toronto's Applied Mindfulness Meditation Specialization Program, co-chair of the Ontario chapter of the Mindfulness and Law Society, and I'm also a performance specialist at another organization, uh, Mindful Gateway. And so my interest is um, heavily into building anti-fragile mindsets, uh, growth mindsets, how to manage uh, risk and uncertainty, um, through personal development. I uh, had a, a prior career in uh, project management, so I dealt a lot with risk uh, within the utility sector. And I left that um, I left that career as a result of uh, experiencing burnout myself, which led me towards exploring more on um, how we can develop human capital in order to um, both increase performance and also manage risk. So what I'm coming in with today is uh, a passion for um, sort of uh, in engaging organizations in understanding that their human capital is an important part of a risk management strategy um, beyond just productivity and performance, but also looking at how we build resilience and uh, anti-fragility into organizations, minimizing internal risk, and then allowing organizations to be better prepared to deal with external risk, particularly global events like the one that we're experiencing right now. Thank you, Sora. Set the stage, take the conversation away. So I, I hear a lot about risk and uncertainty lately. Just see, let's just see what is it and then why lately so much focus on this, what has changed? Well, yeah, I think that in, in one respect, we can begin to look at risk and understand that there is a greater awareness of the non-traditional perspective on risk. And I would say the traditional perspective has traditionally been for organizations to look at risk from a uh, an insurance perspective. Do we have the coverage to insure us against this risk if it materializes? Uh, what's happened, I think, and what's, what continues to evolve is that, as I started in my introduction, that people are starting to realize risk is not static and that the mitigation efforts we put towards risk, they erode over time. So we've got to redefine risk. You know, they talk so much today about risk appetite. And mm -hmm. I will tell you that experience wise, risk appetite is unlimited. Any CEO in any large organization has an unlimited appetite for risk. What we really need to begin to start to look at is not the appetite, but how much risk can we absorb as an organization before we get so inundated, we can, we, we literally fail. Mm -hmm. So if we look at issues of, you know, human capital, a uh, big issue today is talent. How are we going to replace the, you know, aging workforce? And do the people coming into the workforce have the skills? Uh, I mentioned that it, this is another conference, but in the petrochemical industry, roughly about 80 to percent of the petrochemical engineers are due to retire. In the nuclear industry, over 57 percent due to retire. They're not being replaced because people aren't going into those skill areas. So hence, we've got a huge risk because we depend on those industries uh, for power, electricity, etc. So it, it it's kind of a how do, how do I look at risk absorption? How do I look at uh, customer tolerance? You know, I've got a risk. My customers got a risk. My customers got a risk. I've got a risk. We both have to look at how we share that risk and then how we can move to mitigate it. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over now to, I'm sure somebody's got something to say. Um, actually, yeah, that's a great point that you brought up, uh, Gary, on um, the aging population, because that's one thing I've been looking at is sort of, you know, we've created this um, uh, culture or narrative around um, uh, for younger generations based on what the older generation has experienced on um, sort of what um, uh, um, 
career mobility looks like, uh, this concept around, you know, hard work equals, um, uh, equals up, like societal mobility. And that, I think that narrative is still being pushed um, quite a lot that if you work hard, that will equal stability and security. And we're finding that, you know, in the younger generations, they're struggling with this idea um, because they're experiencing things differently as far as, what is it, like wage stagnation, social mobility, um, indebtedness. And so trying to, you know, create a culture where we're looking at, we need to have, you know, cultivated talent to be able to replace this aging workforce, but that the economy doesn't really operate in the same way that that generation that is retiring had. And so changing that narrative to be able to better fit the, um, you know, the younger demographic that's coming in and how do we nurture that workforce in a way that's going to both, you know, motivate them and encourage them to, um, to engage in the workforce in, you know, areas that you're talking about where there's opportunity that maybe is, um, you know, being overlooked for a variety of reasons that there, if there's, you know, issues in mobility, entry points, access, um, that sort of thing. If there's a, you know, an, uh, a culture or narrative issue around entering those, um, those sectors. And I think, you know, looking at business and organizational risk as well, traditionally, like coming from the part of my background that's risk management based, you know, that ends up looking a lot at, you know, these sort of explicit risk factors, as opposed to some of the more implicit things, you know, and I really think that we should be looking at, you know, human capital, like, you know, wellness of, um, of people as part of like a health and safety strategy. So I, um, you know, I, I'm looking at that and saying like, we've got traditionally under, you know, risk, um, when you're doing risk analysis, anything that's sort of over 20% would be considered significant or high risk. And when we're considering that, you know, one in four individuals will experience a mental health event in their lifetime, that, that you know, that being at 25% is, I think that overall, not just from an organizational perspective, but a societal perspective, like that's an unacceptable um, risk as far as it comes from my perspective. I'll pass it on now. I can, I can keep going, but I won't. <laughs> Rika, your thoughts. Um, so many interesting points. Um, what I'm especially, what I was wondering while listening to both of you was, how, what would you say, is there like a shift of paradigm regarding risk of like affinity even? Like, is there like the older generation more looking for mitigating risks and there's a younger generation now actually taking on more risks and being more like open to uncertainty and taking mm. risks? It's an interesting question. Um, I, I would say that there, and I don't want to make this sound bad, but it's that the younger generation in some respects is very naive about risk and therefore is willing to maybe embrace a little bit more risk because they're just not as aware of it. So you know, I, I learned a long time ago that there are certain things that we just accept because we're so used to them that are, are essentially a big risk. So transparent, what I call transparent vulnerabilities, things that you accept because you're so used to dealing with them. You, you, who plans on having an accident when they get in their vehicle, yet you put on a seatbelt? Why? You know, who plans on uh, seeing a, a risk materialize because we've done a risk assessment? Well, you know, the likelihood and probability become into play. But I think that as we transition, there is a, what do you put, a growing knowledge gap uh, where the older workforce is less inclined to share. Mm -hmm. and the younger workforce, in some respects, is too busy to uh, listen. You know, so it, it, I kind of chuckle because with crisis management, it's always a challenge. And I had a conversation one time and I said, well, what, what do you do when your crisis management team assembles and there's somebody there that's, and you're 
telling them about this great crisis unfolding and they've got their phone and saying, whatever, uh, you know, so it's a generational thing. But there's a lot of hope because I think that the generation is quicker to act and they embrace a lot of the technology that the older generation is challenged with. What I find very, very interesting, um, again, listening to you is what I hear also, it has a lot to do with perception of risk because you say that um, the younger generation is, of course, sometimes more naive because of less experience, etc. What I'm very interested in is how to feel also more safe because since risk is a very like um, subjective thing, that's to me is very interesting because you feel like, as you said, uh, you you put on the seatbelt because you feel more safe if you probably if you put on the seatbelt, and um, then there is a situation when something happens like um, a plane crash or something, and all of a sudden people won't won't buy plane tickets anymore because all of a sudden the feeling of safety is um, yeah has decreased a lot, but uh, the objective risk hasn't hasn't changed at all. So what I'm dealing with also in my work is how is it possible also in uncertainty to feel more safe? Because uncertainty and insecurity is not the same. And especially in, in the German language, we the, the two words are almost the same for insecurity, like unsafety and uncertainty. So people would use, um, I, I don't like uncertainty, but they actually mean is I really don't like to feel unsafe. So what I'm... I'm sort of working with is how is it possible to feel more safe in spite of in in spite of uncertainty because uncertainty in the end just means that you don't know and it doesn't necessarily have to mean that you are not safe hmm um, I mean, I would look at from, again, back into this sort of like human capital or um, getting into a personal development perspective is, you know, when you are in a culture that sort of value, overvalues independence, um, they sort of fast pace, um, lacking uh, engagement in community and some of the more sort of um, anchoring things that end up uh, contributing to well-being for humans that that can, you know, it, erode that sense of of safety and I mean we know that um, when we talk about burnout or stress that I'm not talking about removing stress it's more of a stress looking at stress optimization and you know how do we um, challenge people in a way that has that optimal amount of stress so that we're seeing you know the best in productivity and potential but without moving into this always plugged in um, burnout driven society that we're currently in because what we're seeing you know people for example, you know, someone who's not stressed can process about seven pieces of information at one time and someone who is stressed that drops down to three. So being able to be more objective about um, risk or safety, the information that com is coming in changes. We also tend to see, um, you know, less openness to um, different perspectives and opinions when people are stressed and when people are highly stressed um, or there's a feelings of scarcity which we're, I think we're seeing with COVID-19 is where we get a lot more into sort of tribalism and a sense of um, a lack of safety that um, you know objectively with we have yes COVID-19 going on but objectively you know the world is safer than it ever has been overall and yet you know we have people um, reporting like the highest levels of anxiety. I think it's like 39% of Americans when asked if they feel more anxious this year than they did last year say yes. So I think we have like on what uh, Rika is talking about is like a huge perspective problem on how, you know, we're viewing the world and, um, and, you know, how we're processing the information and how we're relating that to our sense of safety. And then that of course, impacts our, you know, our openness, or our willingness to engage in in risk or, or um, sit with un uncertainty. Thank you, Sarah. But what's happening in this area? What are organizations doing? I think organizations are. Uh, so how would I put? They organizations, I think, are kind of muddling through with uh, a focus on 
what do I need to do to comply with regulations that relate to risk and, com and com general compliance? And how do I then make sure my enterprise is in, in uh, compliance, not necessarily is my enterprise, as Ricky said, safe? Is it functional? from a standpoint of risk exposure, et cetera. So, you know, it's interesting. We talk about the current COVID situation. In 2008, 2009, we had the potential with H5N1, the bird flu, to mm -hmm. become a pandemic. Mm -hmm. I wrote a book called Protecting Your Business in a Pandemic. Uh, wrote several articles that have, over the years, been updated on the potential economic consequences. Earlier this year, when the pandemic was declared, and by the way, we had another one before this in 2010 with H1N1, which was a pandemic. Uh, the people this morning, I just saw in the, in the news, uh, H1N1, when it was a pandemic, there were over 60 million people affected by it. Did not make the headlines that COVID is making. So perception-wise, we suddenly see a major risk. If you do some historical, and when I wrote the book, because bird flu looked like the uh, potential emergent pandemic. I analyzed history and began to realize that there, for a pandemic, it generally runs, uh, before it burns out, 500 to 800 days. We're just approaching 180 days. We've got a long way to go. And if you take out you know, the Black Death, which was years, uh, this this becomes an average. You can find information on this on Wikipedia, uh, on a, a website called Visual Capitalist, which is really great for information graphics. They've actually taken the history of pandemics and visualized, made it visual so you can see the history and whatnot. But the fact I point out to people is that we don't really understand the risks that we face. So as a result, when I wrote the book, uh, a colleague said, would you like to have the chairman of the board at the time, Chicago Board of Trade, write the intro? He was slightly re reluctant. Then I gave him my paper on the economic consequences, and he said, yeah, I'd love to. Come to my office. And if you've ever seen the movie Trading Places with Eddie Murphy, you know how I felt. <laughs> As he's pointing out things, and I'm thinking, oh, geez. <laughs> uh, but he, he tells me, he said, you know, we're going to have a real crisis potentially with food. And they're like, yeah, because we're going to have you know, distribution problems, supply chain problems, this risk. He said, no, see these guys down in these pits? They won't take the risk. And I'm like, okay. And it, his point was really simple. And this is where he come up with this issue of transparent vulnerabilities. There are roughly in the United States, 80,000 agricultural inspectors. These are the guys who go out and put the USDA stamp of approval on the side of beef, the other agricultural products. He said, based on what you're telling me and based on what CDC projected, that 40% of the, these, the workforce would be impacted. He said, if we lose 40% of those people, the people who are trading commodities will not take the risk because mm -hmm. they don't want to get stuck with a, quote, tainted product. And as he ex said, he said, I can teach you how to clear trades. He says, you're not going to do it very well because it's going to be slow. He says, but I can't teach you what to look for in a side of beef that says stamp it and approve it. So the disruption cap uh, factors become sort of this area of uncertainty that you talk about. And then also become one that's involved with talent because how do you train that expertise? You know, uh, we talk about testing on COVID-19 and we talk about medical uh, response and whatnot. How do you train a nurse? How do you train a doctor? You know, this takes time, years, and you just don't have this ready resource that you can tap into that says, we can take care of that risk. And so if we're looking at this kind of long span for pandemic, we've got a situation of immensely complex risk. And I think one of the things that I point to people is that if you look at risk as a linear process, I recognize it, 
I go to mitigate it. So it's boom, I've done what I needed to do. You really have to look at, did my actions accurately reflect the right move or were they the wrong move? If I didn't do anything, that could be the right move. If I do something, it could be the wrong move. So this complexity is one that makes us have to be, uh, what do you put it, extremely flexible. And that's a talent that I, I find is probably the most challenging to get people to embrace. How can I be more flexible when I'm not used to being really flexible and I'm not comfortable? You know, you talked about the safety and uncertainty. I want to be safe, you know, but why do I wear a seat belt? Because if I don't and the policeman stops me, I'll get a ticket. Mm -hmm. So there's the, the kind of coercive threat or risk that I run. And then I have this other side that says, well, it's good practice because if I do get in an accident, it could save my life. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's, it's those challenges. And I think it's communicating risk in so many ways that people need to embrace and understand and open up more about. I mean, I think this is a tremendous challenge right now for human resource uh, in, uh, departments and companies because they have to communicate to their organization. Mm -hmm. And especially with remote work, it becomes even more challenging because we've become more isolated. And coming back to what you were saying about complexity, I find this um, very, very interesting how to deal with complexity, how to be able to manage com manage complexity. And you were saying that you have to be like flexible and you have to be adaptive. And I, I'm just lately, just recently, I came across an interesting interview with, um, I think he's maybe a complexity research from Australia. His name is Tyson Yanka Porter. And I'm just, I'm, I just this, I have this quote that I really, really liked. Um, he was saying that in complexity, there aren't any right solutions and anybody who thinks they have a solution or they have a plan or a design or anything like that that's what he said they're an idiot you can't dynamic systems don't operate like that you have a thing called emergence we know this we know the science on it emergence is the only thing that can deal with these kind of complexities so all you can do and this is what i really like is foster the conditions for emergence and just behave with integrity and maybe others will do the same and this I found really, really fascinating. So to to um, not be so much all about control and have everything under control, but realize that in chaotic um, and also complex circumstances like right now, it's super difficult to have the one solution or even impossible to have the one solution. But um, like be with the trouble, like lean into uncertainty and mm -hmm. um, foster conditions for emergence and... Um, be very like observant and open to anything that will sort of show up. Yeah. Hmm. I, think, I think Sarah touched on the issue earlier in some of her comments that uh, the, the human element becomes a huge factor in this. And this whole aspect of uncertainty is really uh, getting another mindset developed where we become, as you say, more uh, how do I, comfortable with uncertainty mm -hmm. because it's it's a very uncertain world and especially now because there's so much that is impacting us on a daily basis that we're deluged with uncertainty mm -hmm. and how do we continue to to be able to you know I think mentally stay okay mm -hmm. and then also how do we deal with it from a standpoint of of being productive in a work environment. Yeah. I think, um, yeah, on that, like if we're talking about, say, like, ha you know, having cognitive flexibility um, in, in, you know, being able to, and that's, you know, being able to uh, change your opinion, hold opposing opinions, um, that sort of thing. But I'm wondering, I want to ask a question to maybe both Gay and uh, Arika on this is, you know, a little bit of what I'm talking about on the individual um, uh, individual aspect is having somewhat of a, of a contingency reserve <laughs> and an ability to make demands. But running on sort of a um, uh, organizational or even um, looking at 
the scope even broader in, in, in pr a whole profession or um, the economy as a whole is whether our sort of extreme drive towards efficiency has created issues with um, sort of depleting any sort of contingency reserve that we have on, um, like we said, on human capital. I think Gary, you mentioned this and said, you know, it's hard to trust some of these skills and, you know, we've got this workforce issue that's going to come up. And, you know, I think as we've tried to look at um, human capital as a cost rather than an asset and trying to get more out of our individual workers, we've lost that you know, if you wanted to look at it from from, you know, risk management as a contingency reserve, like we just we don't have that um, because we've, you know, I think and tell me you think like my thought is you're sort of maxing out the people that are available already and we don't have that additional contingency or bandwidth to be able to build demand as, um, you know, as as uh, as it arises. And I love what you said about like the bandwidth, and I I, I completely agree that and this focus on efficiency, for, in my in my view, is a problem because we are so result oriented, but we also need to be like result open at the same time, like the two sides of the same coin, um because and there's this pyramid I think pyramid of the unknown, where it's just like the top of it is what we know that we know. Mm -hmm. And then we have like things that we don't know we know and we know we don't know but the biggest part of the pyramid is the unknown unknown like things we don't know that we don't even know and if we always just look at the stuff that we know that we know it's just very very um, small and narrow and mm -hmm. i love this like i love this um the idea of serendipity like to coincidentally come across something come across a solution but if you're like always so in efficient and focused on the solution it's very very difficult to um, experience serendipity and i love mm. the i love the example of columbus you know columbus um, he was wrong he was really really wrong like he, he completely entirely miscalculated the distance between mm. europe and asia and if he had been right yeah, like the, the completely different history. So there were scientists at the time in, when he was alive that they, who already knew that he was wrong, <laughs> but um, he wasn't listening. And that's the thing. Like he just he just went for it, and he sort of stumbled across the continent of America. And I love this example of that. We have, if we are too focused all the time, we might miss out on many things like our left and right of our like the path that we've chosen. Yeah, so there's like the we're talking we've been talking a lot about risk, but there's the opportunity um, cost as well, right? When we get I understand what you're saying we're on this hyper focus, hyper efficiency, then we're missing all of the things that come out of like creativity and divergent thinking, and and um, and even like you said, just the explore the results of sort of non directed exploration. I I I to I really I totally agree with what you have to say there, Rika. Thank you, Sara. Rico, Gary, great conversation. And this is what exactly it was. Unfortunately, we're falling short of time. But but I really want to take this time, a quick short nutshell, if you were, to let our uh, viewers uh, know what would be that big two takeaways that you want them to go away with or you're going to take away with you. Please. Uh, whoa, that's a hard one. Um, <laughs> I would say that, that, that for the viewer to begin to understand that they're mentally, when approaching risk, have to be very, very flexible. Because as I stated when I started, risk is not static. When you recognize a risk, you've already changed the risk's nature. Mm -hmm. So if other people are recognizing similar, the same risk, the risk is continually in a non-static area. So we have to become much more flexible in our decision-making and to uh, realize that, well, there is a wealth of information and uh, accessibility via the internet of so much that we only can have, as you said, Sarah, a bandwidth of so much. And, and that we have to be able to be willing to not look in finite terms at decision making. I make a decision as I'm moving forward with it. As I start to see more information, I need to be able to be flexible to change the decision and direction. And I need to have the people that I'm working with understand and embrace that 
uncertainty in that regard. Thank you, Gary. Sarah, Rico. Um, yeah, I would agree with um, Gary, like really, but you know, it's a movement towards, he said, more flexibility, whether that be um, encouraging, you know, growth mindsets, um, fostering, you know, more cognitive flexibility, either within your organization or in your recruitment practices. I think we have a a pretty heavy focus on, you know, explicit skills, um, like hard skills, an obsession with data, at least in the, the Western world, and not um, a lot of room to explore, as, as Rick has said, like anything that can't be so-called proven. And I mean, we should know people thought the world was flat at one point. So that was a fact until it wasn't a fact anymore. So having that you know, mindset where you can look at it and say like, this is, yes, this is the information that we have right now, but being able to have that, um, that uh, openness to, to the uncertainty, to the alternatives and, and really start to kind of um, drive that as a core value within, you know, yourself and your organization would be the starting point that I would, I would probably have as the takeaway. Yes, I, I am completely agree with what both of you said and even though like there are of course there are strategies how to deal with uncertainty how to feel safe um, in spite of uncertainty and also risk um, I agree and I think that um, this, this leaning into uncertainty and the well if you, if you can say I don't know this is really powerful because it opens up a lot of possibilities and there's this one last thing I wanted to say um, I wanted to quote this philosopher Charles Eisenstein and I really like what he said about um, that there's this sacred space between two certainties and this is where new information can come in and this is what I, I really love like this is an, an, a different attitude thank you so much Rika thank you all the panelists the viewers who are viewing us from all around the world this is why they say Conversations are powerful. Conversations must happen. Conversations must continue to happen. Looking forward to this conversation to continue and then be much, much, much more fruitful. Thank you so much, all of y'all. John Chirin signing off with the panelists and the viewers and Catalyzing the Future team. See you soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.
Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. How, how are you both? Well. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, very good for a dull day in Nottingham. Th there you go. There you go. So, so, so thank you both for being here. I, I wanna, I wanna welcome all our guests. We have the privilege and honor to be with Allison and Terry today, and these fine, brilliant folks are going to get into a conversation around normal. But before we dive in, <laughs> and normality, and whatever all that means, before we dive in, Allison, I would love for you to introduce yourself, and then we'll go to Terry. Okay, so yeah, my name's Alison Knox, and I fly under the flag of uh, Everyday Angels, which is a, a title that was kind of gifted to me, really, for my artwork, which is, um, there's one behind me. Um, basically, yeah, I, I work with angels. I, I, I kind of put myself in the category of angels advocates, um, and we rub along together pretty well now. Um, and they have become part of my normal, <laughs> which I totally appreciate is not part of everybody else's normal. Um, I also work as a, a funeral celebrant uh, in my day job. So, yeah, it's a good balance. Wonderful. Um, yeah, I'll let Terry, <laughs> Terry fill in her gaps now. Um, I am Teresa or Terry DiPaolo. I have a life where I get called both names and sometimes I prefer one over the other and other times I don't. So whatever works for you. Um, I am just a girl <laughs> and I work for a major insurance company leading a team of subrogation specialists and go through life trying to do the best, do it the best way I can. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. So I want to, I want to pose, the, I want to express the rationale as to why both of you are here and then really leave it at your hands a bit. Uh, the wisdom that Allison you put forward is pretty brilliant. I'll put it that way, and I think people <laughs> tapping into it. And likewise for for Terry, I've known Terry for some time, and she mm. has the ability to, as I like to say, see into things and see into people, if you will, and really see the humanity. So I'm very interested in, in kind of both of your perspectives, and the audience could learn from you. What is normal all about? What's it mean? Well, if I could just start by saying where this um, this intrigue for me came, it was very recently because it was actually um, from a conversation with yourself, Sai, and we've not known each other for five minutes, really. Um, but I was out walking the dog and a, and a word came crashing into my head, which was transnormality. I'd never heard the word transnormality. Um, and so I was just curious as to what that might mean. And before I even got anywhere near Google search or a dictionary, my own personal understanding of it was that transnormality was a, a temporary state of being that was not expected to be permanent. Um, so it was it was a liminal space, if you like. That's that was my understanding of it. Um, and I'm sure that there are there are other understandings of it. But for me, that that sat well and made sense about where we are right now and I don't know about you but um, in my day-to-day -day work I get a lot of people who are begging for normal to be restored that's all they want they want normality back mm -hmm. and so this is the question is what what constitutes normality what is normal um, and I guess I, I look back on my own life and my journey and I see somebody who was you know it kind of yeah as terry said i just a person i get getting on with my life i was in the fashion industry for many years it was a, a kind of brutal and commercial world and in those days my normal shaped up very differently from how normal is to me today and when i lost my footing in that world um through a, a very public redundancy at the time I just craved that normality back. I wanted it so much um, that I, I, I built a, a, a version of that normality for myself on sand, basically. <laughs> it was never going to, it was not a sustainable situation. But it, it was all I could do at the time to, to shore myself up and to, to give myself some sense of, of, of normal. 
um, I look back on that now and I can see that was not normal behavior. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was a very <laughs> abnormal thing to do. Yes. I would never do it now, but at that time that was, that was all I had. Um, and then my reality shifted um, further down the line several times. So I don't know if that kind of um, puts a little, a little bit of little concrete on the base there to get started on the conversation. No, I think you make great points. I think normality is very fluid and it's very individual. Um, you know, you talk about changing industries. My dad, when he retired, it was a big deal. We had to have a family meeting that this man who had worked so hard all his life was allowed to retire. I'm like, of course you should retire. Before the ink was dry, he had found another job. <laughs> he was afraid <laughs> of that change of normal. Um, yeah. And eventually he went, you know, I, I, I am too old for this and, and stopped that. And then he went into just the most bizarre schedule of uh, and he had to physically sit and write. This is what I'm doing at 9 a.m. This is what I'm doing at 10 a.m. I need to accomplish these four things today before he could really make the transition from work life normal to retired life normal. Mm. Um, some of us, it's in, especially right now, we have to make some of those fluid adjustments so much more fat, quickly than we were would like to. Um, that I think it's it's very stressful and, and challenging for many. I think when when you talk to people, um, I mean, broad brushstroke here, but often change is, is inflicted on people because they have been, and I I can't count myself in that category because you resist. The change you resist it so hard it either it makes you ill or it makes you um so um unable to function in the right way that that the change has to be forced upon you so whether that's a redundancy or or, or as actually then became my case um at 31 i was diagnosed with um cancer and I wasn't even ill. I had no symptoms. It was just a damned inconvenience. Um, and I'd been applying for an, another job, having spent a year in the wilderness, having lost the, the position I'd had. And um, suddenly, you know, what constituted normal for me changed beyond all recognition um, because I had to face something that I had never even contemplated, ever. I was not a person who was given to poorliness. Um, and so the, 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 the end result of, of, of that, that was, it was quite, in many ways, it was kind of quite a brutal um, circumstance because it, it was very quick and I, and I had to go undergo major surgery, which fortunately dealt with the problem as such. Um, but then, you know, living, living with the aftermath of that was, was a lifetime's job. <laughs> <laughs> and um yeah and and so yeah and there's no going back from those things you know there's a there's a there's a there's a quote i really love by caroline miss as uh, she wrote the en entering the castle and she says it's not easy to have your reality stretched to the boundaries of the cosmos and then squeezed back into your physical body and i've always seen that as being like you know, like your knicker elastic. If somebody pulls your knicker elastic out <laughs> and lets it go, oh, you get <laughs> and suddenly the shock, it's the shock of that thing, it brings you back. But it's, it is very, very hard. When you've been put in a situation or shown a, a, an experience, uh, as I went on to have, um, Pandora's box has been opened. Mm -hmm. How do you unknow what you now know? And how do you use what you now know in a way that would even begin to make sense to anybody else? And that's, and that's the challenge. Absolutely, very insightful. And I think that's a lot of the struggle that people have is what do you do with what you now know? How yeah. do you use that to your benefit and, and to create your new normal and have it be a new normal yeah. that you're comfortable in? Yeah, yeah. And the risk in sharing that with other people is that you can be pilloried for it, you know, to even, you know, when I first started doing the work with angels, so just to give you a context, um, I underwent the surgery 
um, on the, it was the 22nd of November 1991. On the 22nd of November 2001, the first angel appeared to me in my work. And it was an experience I had absolutely no preparation for. And I think I, I, I said to Sai once in a conversation that my ignorance has been my blessing. It truly has, because if I had known what was to be asked of me or what was to come, I would have been terrified. It, you know, it's it, for me to be to be faced with whatever it is I've got to deal with and just deal with it is is the best policy. And so when these this this energy appeared, it was I, I think it's it's regarded as a kind of spontaneous awakening. And I literally was blasted to the other sides of the universe and brought together again and squeezed back into five foot six flesh and bone. And and I had to live with it. And for a long time, you know, that that experience of of, of carrying this, you know, I, I, I'd, be going, <laughs> I'd be going around my, about my normal business. I'd be in the supermarket, say, doing a bit of shopping and I'd suddenly get this overwhelming um, urge that I had to go back to go and do some work. And, and I'd literally have to leave the tree in the middle of the shop and disappear. And it became an encumbrance. It became a liability. And I even went to the doctors and I said, just check me for madness. And the doctor said, what's, what's your problem? I explained. And he said, fill this form in. I went through this basic. And he said, you're not mad. You're just a bit odd. And I thought, well, that's all right. I can live with odd. And then, you know, then I, then I started to, 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 you know, look at this longing for normal again. You know, oh, God, you know, it was so all right. When I, you know, I didn't have to do this all the time. I didn't have to constantly be in my studio up to my neck in paint, you know. Um, and, and there was this awful adjustment period, which was in many ways very painful. And yet, you know, people say, oh, you know, I'd love to see angels. I'd love to I'd love to work with angels. And it doesn't matter whether it's angels or anything else. You know, often we crave something. We want something. We see it on the horizon. We think that looks really fabulous and we want it so badly. When we get there, it's like, oh, I'm not too sure now. You know, the, <laughs> the responsibility of it is so great. You know, I do find, you know, sometimes I think to myself, oh, God, you know, why me? Why did you get me to do this? You know, I have no idea what you're asking me about. Um, and they said, well, you know, you don't need to know. We know. You just yep. crack on, do the work. So, so, I, so yeah, so, de so de I de have, de yeah. normality but, doesn't exist. <laughs> well said, very well said. So I have, I have a question then for, for both of you. And again, mm -hmm. if we look at the way that society operates, whatever, cultural, et cetera, how much of normality or the notion of normal for that matter is really conditioned in us? Mm. I was actually thinking about that um, just moments ago in that, you know, there, it changes obviously what gets conditioned, I think. Um, but Hey, the American way, 1950s, you grow, you go to school, you go to college, you get a job, you may have a family, you retire, you take care of your parents, you move on, you know, you have the, this routine. And I think that's a big part of our culture and our, our society that puts these ideas that this is what you're supposed to do. This is how you're supposed to follow your path through life. And when that's not the path that you're following, you get that a little bit of anxiety. I'm like, am I doing the right thing? This isn't what they want me to do. <laughs> you know? And that that thing that's right for you doesn't have to fit that mold. No, I, I, I'm always interested in the they's. You know, when people say, oh, they don't let me do that or, or they wouldn't approve. Who, who be they? Who be they? Exactly. And, and, and then trying to dig down into who the they's were who lay, laid these rules down in the first place. And nobody knows. You know, you often find this. <laughs> In, when I used to work in fashion, um, the fashion industry, I, I worked for many companies, and you'd always come in with 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 you know somebody else's inherit inheritance on your desk, mm -hmm. and you, you, you'd have to take that over, and you'd question things. So, Why with all this? They go, oh well, they've always done it that way. Who be they? 
No idea. One day, I tell you, I actually did this. I, I inherited a somebody's office and job. And I went in with bin bags and I put everything in the bin bags. Every single thing in that office went in the bin bag and I chucked it out. And I thought, if it's important, someone will come and ask me about it. <laughs> and I think probably two two things or three things maybe came up. And I said, oh, I've, I've not, not got the information about it. You have to give, give it to me again, please. And And that was it. That was oh, that was it was barely nothing. So you you know you sometimes you 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 inherit um, mm-hmm. other other people's stuff as as the truth, mm-hmm. and, and and you have to discern for yourself whether it is your truth as well, or whether it's even relevant to you in any mm-hmm. way at all. And what are the consequences of of letting it go, deciding for yourself? Mm-hmm. You know, I think it's interesting that so much of raising children there's always that that i I don't know what word to use here but you know toddlers why 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 Mm -hmm. (laughs) and then you get into i have to solve a problem what's the first thing you do you say why you answer that and then you say but why (laughs) and you go through a whole list of whys children are brilliant Without being told that they need to use this method, they're using it from day one. <laughs> yeah, I think if we kept that same level of curiosity that children have as adults, it might stand us in better stead. Because if we ask more questions about the things we get ourselves involved in, um, you know, we perhaps would be better placed to know whether we were doing the right thing or not, rather mm-hmm. than just accepting things as, as they are and as they're presented to us. And, and it does worry me, you know, the amount of information that is now bandied about, you know, on, on social media sites and on the news and things. And I'll be honest with you, I, I barely watch the news. You know, I, 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 I just watch the headlines, turn it off. I only I only read a newspaper because I do the crossword with my mother. Same. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> it just doesn't. You know, I, it, I I I just think to myself, yeah, whatever. And you know, I I'm not. I, it's not that I I I wish to appear ignorant, but I don't wish to engage in the store in 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 the story. It's the noise. Drama in the noise and the drama exactly yeah, and, drama. and, and i think you run the risk of sounding ignorant by hearing the story and buying into have it, buying into it every time because somebody else is going to tell the story another way yeah yeah absolutely yeah and you know it's in, in the work i do in my celebrant work i have to sit with families in their worst of times and i have to ask them some very searching questions about their loved ones And I've got, I write longhand, I don't type anything up, it's all done with biros on paper. And then my job is to write that into a narrative story and and present that back to the family as a tribute that will be read on behalf of their loved one. Mm -hmm. And it is amazing how um, families don't realise how much they've given me. Yeah. (laughs) And, (laughs) and, And how how easy it is for a story to be um say not not manufactured but woven from some little snippets and then you know then you tell that story and then afterwards you know people come up and say oh you know and you they, they hear different parts of it not everybody hears the same the same story from start to finish that that's that's something else that i'm very very conscious of that you know um if you if you tell tell a story to a group of twelve people, you'll get twelve different stories told back to you. <laughs> All surrounding the same theme. <laughs> yeah, on the theme. Yeah, maybe yeah. the theme, but but certainly the detail will all be all be heard differently. Absolutely. Um, and so you know, again, you know, if we're coming back to the to the theme of of our normality. You know, we can all live in the same experience and come out of it with different stories. And depending on our, um, maybe depending on, you know, our own resilience, our own 
background, our experiences that have brought us to that particular point at which that experience happened, that will depend on, you know, that will influence how, how we, how we deal with that. And, and, you know, whether we can accept what we've just experienced as, as normal or not. So, so, so I'm sorry, Terry, were you gonna, were you gonna add something? Forgive me. No, no. <laughs> I no. could tell that you were ready. <laughs> yeah. so, so I very openly, and I've said this to both of you in, in separate conversations, I've always been all in, in with both of you, quite honestly, because you, I have, I have literally witnessed you pierce, and I've known Terry for, for a, a number of years, pierce the veil of normality. You know, what guidance can you offer the world? You do it so naturally. Terry and, and Allison, what guidance can you offer the world of, of how we can better deal with this and you know, pierce to, to get to the, the reality behind everything? Well, I've said it before, I'll say it again, probably till my dying day, always approach every situation with compassion and humility. <laughs> yeah. um, to Allison's point, everybody has a different story for the same timeline, for the same theme understand the other people's perspective, understand their story, their side, their, their points before you make a judgment or decide for them what's, what's right for them or what they need to do. And, you know, everybody's got this, like I said, fluidity and individuality compassionately and, and humil mm. humility is important and mm. working I'm, with others in that. Kindness goes a long way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as my mother would have said, normal is as normal does. You know, one person's normal is somebody else's completely com barking bonkers. Um, and so, yeah, I just yeah, I just feel that you know, if we can find it within ourselves to just be kinder mm -hmm. to others and and ourselves as well, then we would be a lot better off. But to truly accept that, you know, there is not a one size fits all when it comes to truth. It's, it's, that, it's great. It's great wisdom and easy to say, but so many people have challenges with it. I mean, tremendous yeah. challenges with it. And, 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 you know, and it comes with ease exactly as, as Alison, you, you know, you, you eloquently express for those that allow it to come with ease. Mm. But so many struggle with it. Mm. And I struggled with it. I, re I did struggle with it. I went into battle with myself and, 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 you know, I went into battle with my own truth for a long time. And, and I thought I beat myself up quite hard for a long time. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm easy with it now, but you know, it's, it's, it's not, um, it's not something that we are encouraged to, to do. Yeah. That's, that's the problem, you know? Yeah. I like to plan things. I like to know that everything's in its place and everything's in its order and, and all of that. But I, so I tend to do that. Here's what my ideal outcome for this or this plan or agenda, whatever the case may be, this is ideal. Yeah. It's not going to happen. So where, where am I comfortable landing is my next thought. <laughs> Somebody's going to change my plan from this to this. Where am I going to be okay with it? And I try to lower that bar as far as I can get it. <laughs> I tend to be quite footloose in my visions. I, I, I may see the thing on the horizon and I'm sort of squinting. I think I'm not sure what you are, but show me how to get there. And we'll have a look when we get, when we, when we're, we're a bit nearer. You know, and, and then you can you can assess as you go along the way sometimes as well. You know, it doesn't you don't have to sort of. Um, you don't, Well, for me personally, knowing it all ahead of the game is not a good thing. Mm -hmm. Show me show me in short incremental stages where I feel I can bail out at any time. But I, I don't tend not to. But no. <laughs> it, that's that's the feeling I like to have. You know, I've got the key to the door. <laughs> so if nothing else, if nothing else, and there's a lot of, lot of things that you've offered the world to really digest, really being able to find the courage within ourselves, right? To express that kindness, to express that compassion yeah. and truly question ourselves in terms of what we perceive as normal or if, or if we apply the label of abnormal, if you will, whatever mm -hmm. label that we're playing with. So I know we're, I know we're running into the time block here, but I, I definitively want to thank both of you tremendously and again oh, call me call me selfish 
call me selfish for inviting both of you because I've, I've known <laughs> the dynamic, if you will. <laughs> Thank you both so much. Thank you. It's Sai. a pleasure, an absolute pleasure. Lovely to meet you. You as well. I <laughs> appreciate that probably more than having the opportunity to talk to Sai again. <laughs> Not that I don't love you, Sai. <laughs> uh, likewise, understood completely. Understood completely. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.
Hello, everybody. <laughs> Hello. For a wonderful conversation. How are you today? <laughs> good, good. Good. Well, good evening Hi. from uh, Eastern Europe, Romania. Uh, good afternoon to Western Europe and good morning to America. Indeed. I'm Cyprian Moga. I'm Cyprian Moga. I'm a business transformation advisor. And uh, today I will moderate a very interesting conversation and panel about business and anti-fragility. Uh, I experienced very a lot of uh, flavors during my consultancy career from um, classical change management or continuous improvement, re-engineering, transformation, agility, and now anti-fragility. I have a pleasure to have with me today three uh, great gentlemen of anti-fragility. Uh, it's a very interesting com combination because two of them come from a domain that are very much ahead and connected with, with anti-fragility in the recent year from information technology. And another one, uh, I have, it's a seasoned, seasoned consultant and professor and, and expert who experienced many industry and fields, um, maybe, maybe less in information technology, but the other one, plenty of them. I will let them introduce uh, one, oh, one of, uh, and maybe we take one, two minutes each to talk about your background and your experience in uh, anti-fragility, and then we will kick off. We can go in alphabetical order if you want to, if you want to invite each other. So perhaps <laughs> the first could be Roderick <laughs> or Tony. Okay, Tony. Um, <clears throat> I think, let me start. Um, so I, basically, um, I, I, I was wanting to study architecture and art and end up doing software and software development. So I, I used to consult a lot. Um, and uh, predominantly today, I, I, uh, day to day, I do more programming and development. Um, systems design and things like that. Um, but uh, I wrote a thesis on building architecture as a reference for architecture intensive disciplines. Um, and uh, I use, like Barry, I, I really appreciate the, the patterns of nature and anti-fragility in, in designing systems. Uh, but I resonate also with Tony around um, pretty much the, the business and human side element of, of business um, and working in a very organic kind of community and network model. Okay. Uh, I think Roderick has half introduced me already, which is quite good. Tony Bendel. Um, I'm a former professor of policy management. I was the Rolls-Royce professor of policy management at the University of Leicester in the UK. My career has been about trying to improve organizations, trying to make them able to become anti-fragile but it was very late on that I actually recognized that's what I was doing. So I wrote a book back in 2015 on building anti-fragile organizations. And my work is tied up with doing just that. Um, I, I run the Anti-Fragility Academy. And I've also got a consultancy company, Services Limited, based in the UK, but we work globally. Welcome, Tony. Glad to have you here. <laughs> Hey, so uh, my name is uh, Barry O'Reilly. I'm uh, based in, in Stockholm, in Sweden. I'm the founder of a company, a technology company called Black Tulip Technology, um, which does consulting and develops software. Um, and I'm also a researcher, um, currently working towards my PhD in complexity science and software engineering. Uh, former chief architect at Microsoft. I've been in the business for about 20 years. In the last six, seven years, I've been intensely applying uh, complexity science um, to software engineering. And from that, uh, moving from, a, from someone who works predominantly with technology to someone who moves technology people into the, the business side, uh, into uh, having business conversations and understanding the, that you can't build anti-fragile technology uh, on top of uh, fragile business structures. Welcome, Barry. Glad to have you here. And uh, I'm very tempted to start uh, our conversation uh, with something uh, from my shared experience. Of course, I meet uh, each one of us are doing consulting and uh, meeting customers. And what it happens to me now last year is that the anti-fragility topic comes up somehow when I'm in a board. But I have somehow a feeling as talking as fashion victims, you know, 
like you know, I heard somebody talking about uh, I don't know what the, the brand of shoes, and I I'm interested suddenly on that. I have this feeling talking about anti fragility with with, with uh, many executives, and I think the main question that comes up in such situation is I read Taleb's book. It was interesting, tantalizing. I like it. What next? What would you advise in such situation? Wow, who's going first? When <laughs> <laughs> you cannot stand it, just go. <laughs> yeah. I, I would say that I'm very impressed if they finish the book. <laughs> I, 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 I think it's a great book. I think it's got an incredible amount of content and it's yeah. stories, but it's not easy to follow. And in terms of getting an idea, a real understanding of what anti-fragility is about, I don't think it's a particularly good place, honestly. Um, but you're absolutely right. There's a, a dearth of material. I mean, Sai has done some good stuff. I'd say my book was a good stuff. There's not that much literature yet, and there's not that much experience to, to go with. So it is something which is quite a subtle thing. Um, and I would argue strongly, it's something you never reach. Anti-fragility is not uh, something you can obtain. It's something you can pursue. You can become more anti-fragile. And that's what I would always advocate, taking out the fragilities in your organizations, growing the anti-fragility aspects of your organization. And that, to me, always has a lot to do with the people, as well as everything else in terms of the structure of the organization. I think you can work on anti-fragility at every level. I tend to use the Deloitte's layer model as a way of categorizing. So I, I think the, the, the point as well is that, you know, you take a step back because of it and, and actually look at it as a, as a property of value uh, that, that, uh, that you need to utilize in terms of the kind of organization if you're, uh, you're wanting to build, because it's not something that, that is, and sometimes in conversations uh, with proponents, it seems like we're selling something that is actually going to produce. It's a it's a box that we're give, that we're creating, or some kind of thing that that's just going to happen. It's a product. It's not really. It's a property of the organization, perhaps the services, the things that we're creating. And so you need to kind of adopt it in as much as um, you adopt uh, before you write one a building. You can tell an architect that you want ambiance. You know, you have to understand what that means and, and, and interpret it. And I think that's partly the challenge, is interpreting the application of that value in your organization. Yeah, so, so I would say that this is something I recognize as well, Cyprian, and it's something that's uh, that's apparent when, when speaking with executives and senior people who are, who are trying to um, make things a little bit better. There's a healthy skepticism there about the word anti-fragility, as there is about the word complexity, because every time you go into these kinds of discussions, you'll find a huge number of people who will talk all day about complexity and anti-fragility, but they'll never actually tell you what to do. They'll never tell you concretely, here's a thing you can do that will make things better. There's a lot of PowerPoints out there um, across the subject of anti-fragility and, and complexity science. Um, and so what I've been doing um, over the, the last few years is trying to develop uh, uh, ideas that allow executives to have these conversations with technology people to get technology people to understand that there's a lot more going on than just bits and bytes here. There are people in societies and markets and things that we have to understand and getting executives to understand that in all of this, there's no magic pattern or product or idea or process management tool that's going to make everything simple and easy. Um, this is an unholy mess and our lives are about working with unholy messes and here's a set of ideas that can help you to get from where you are now to a point that isn't where you are now that will let you know, know where you have to go in the future uh, rather than these step-by-step -step instructions that we've been doing as management fads for, for so many years. Um, so I think it's important when speaking to these executives to, to have something concrete to say, do this and do this and do this. <laughs> and then we'll, then we'll regroup and figure out what the next set of do this is on. Uh, ironically, Barry, the, the one concrete thing for me recently that, that kind of illustrated for me the reality of anti-fragility was a discussion I was having with two separate discussions with two uh, senior executive levels of their company. And the decisions each of their, the owners of their company decided to take 
because of COVID. So the, the, it was kind of glass half full, glass half empty. So the one strategy of the one owner was to actually see that the economy is going down and they were going to retrench and prepare for closing down the other the owners had decided that they're going to survive and thrive. So the company that uh, the owners that that sent that message to that were told the, the they were going to retrench had sent that message out. And then when the lockdown had had ended and they'd opened up, their sales and work was just uh, had just escalated uh, much higher than it was when they before they closed down. And so they had to ask their staff to actually uh, work overtime. But it was very hard to motivate because the staff had been told that there was going to be a decline in work. That's why they were retrenching and closing down. And yet here they were having to try and work overtime. Uh, the other company, ironically, um, the staff had decided to take a, a fraction of their salary uh, to, to, to allow the company to make it through financially. And uh, their, their, their strategy uh, on opening up was then to acquire some of the companies that the, com the competitors, they realized they'd have less competitors, and those that didn't survive, they'd, they'd um, try and acquire the books in order to, to actually uh, organic or, or build up their, their losses in terms of their client base. And so they're looking for a better year in 2021 and uh, kind of a growth strategy. Um, and it also reminded me of, you know, if in, 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 the, in the natural world, when you look at uh, organisms, living organisms that actually survive after a shock or thrive best, it's sometimes, it's sometimes the simplest organization or organisms with a very singular purpose. And it, I admired this, this uh, group of uh, staff members and individuals in the company that actually decided to take less. Uh, the company had almost re, 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 reorganized themselves, decluttered, made themselves more simpler in a way, and they had the singular goal. And uh, they're looking better than, than the other companies, sorry. I, th I think the COVID argument's a very strong one. Um, a lot of people have been looking at anti-fragility exactly for that reason. Uh, Mark Carney, the former governor of the Bank of England, um, has been talking about it because it's actually a kind of more a cultural issue to me, I believe, this, this sort of imperative. We need to challenge the assumptions we've used to date. We, we haven't done very well with those assumptions behind our organisations, VUCA <laughs> environment. It's volatile, it's uncertain, it's complex, it's ambiguous. We don't know what the next new normal will be, and it will be a cascade of new normals. And in such a world, we can't just put things right, we can't just be agile, because that just means ducking and diving against the current circumstances. We have to develop, we have to learn, we have to get stronger. And that feature of getting stronger is what anti-fragility is about and of course that's the feature of natural systems until this point we even with our technology base as it is today we haven't really done that very well um natural systems when i exercise i get stronger i get stronger from being stressed within limits and that aspect for an organization means you have to challenge every single assumption so my advice for that top team, for the C-suite, for the chief executive, would be to question every assumption you've built the business on, yeah. and share that and work as a group. That challenge is the key ingredient. And when you start that challenge, you'll find that your fragilities are at all kinds of different places. They'll be in your systems, they'll be in your yeah. markets, they'll be in your technology base, that being your supply chain, all of all of these things, all aspects of the organizations have shown fragilities up against COVID, for instance. We weren't prepared enough, we weren't ready. And I think that's because we're not anti-fragile. Yeah. Yes, and so in, in my research, I talk about the concept of residuality, and that is that um, rather than the way that we've done things in the software in industry for many years is that we describe our systems as collections of processes and components. Complex systems can't be adequately described or 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 or, or, or drawn in this way. And a, a residue then, the, the idea of res residuality is that we're built up of uh, lots of structures that represent what's left over when our system is stressed. If those residues aren't in place, then we won't survive. It's not about adapting or evolving in the face of stress, but in, in, for many, many people, when exposed to something like COVID, your, your ability to, to survive is a function of what's going to be left over when you're stressed. 
And we've seen that when we've let our supply chains run dry with PPE in, 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 in the UK and in Sweden. Uh, we've seen that in Sweden, that when you make uh, neoliberal decisions about funding of old people's homes in the 1980s, um, you're going to, and you get stressed in 2020, there's very little you can do about it then. So it's, it, it's about understanding that your organization isn't made up of these simple processes and, and, and components that are focused on the function of your business, but that the survival of your business is based on something else and it needs to be modeled in a completely different way than what we've been doing um, so far. So, so this is why I also like to talk about the autonomy of one. You know, the, if you look at organizations, I think, Tony, it, it, it's more uh, closer to what you're talking about in terms of culture. So I think a lot of businesses that thrive, um, that thrive and do well, and, and pretty much anti-fragility, as Sai says, it's like a spectrum. And as you said, you know, you never get to. So you're trying to achieve this uh, state. And, and, uh, and, and as Barry says, you're, you're putting your organization through not toxic stress that causes kind of cancer and things, but actually the kind of stress that prepares them to be able to to to, to become better. But um, when you have the autonomy of one concept, you know it means individuals in your organization, unlike the 20th century model, this assumption that business economics 101, you have to divide labor up and make them repeatable and make people as machines. We, we need to actually try, challenge that assumption and say, how do we make individuals now working from home and more autonomous as workforces better um, and be able to cope with uh, the increased uh, conditions of, of stress that they're going to have. But also, how does it? How do we create that autonomy of one in a collection of, of of people? So not just the autonomy of one as one person, but as you as we were once saying, autonomy one, two, three, four. Everybody is, is contributing to that oneness. I, th I think I, I agree. I, I think for an organization and for the C-suite, there's a really big cultural issue here. And it's a very different culture to one that we've actually seen. I also think we're suffering from a, a, a poverty of language. We don't really have adequate language for anti-fragility. Even the term isn't very clear, even though it is a unique term. It is an important concept. Um, but all the language we use, we talk about systems, we talk about architects, etc. to me, are a large part of what the problem actually is. Uh, what The worst question I got on the last event I actually did like this uh, with Sai was a question which was basically, following that event, somebody asked me, um, what structure do I want in my organization uh, to make it anti-fragile? And I said, well, that's the problem. Structures are the problem. Most of the anti-fragility in the organization comes from the soft elements, from the people, from their ability to step outside of the systems, to break the system, to be beyond the system, to deal with the unknown and situations we've never seen before. We haven't yet got that even with AI. And I think while soft system thinking, I believe, does give us a good modeling language now for dealing with those sorts of elements, I think we have a massive cultural problem in terms of organizations and management. We keep looking for the hard elements for policies, for process, and indeed for hierarchy. And that's not what anti-fragility is about. Anti-fragility is about the soft flesh around the hard bones of those. And in many cases, it's about the ability to change the hard bones. Yeah, well, you mentioned something that I think a lot of organizations kind of get wrong. It's like legislating behavior. So we like organizations work on policies, procedures, and standards. But the human element doesn't work. That's for processes. Uh, you know, when you establish what I liked about early extreme programming agile um, was that, uh, you know, Kent Beck uh, set up basically values, principles, and practices. So there were five values. Uh, he described principles and then the practices. And in organizations, for instance, where I've seen lots of organizations adopted to very good effect. Um, but an example could be simply that respect is a value. A principle is the way we dress is a sign of respect. Um, but the actual practice may differ from different cultural groups or, uh, or geographical organization areas. So it gives you, it gives the organization that soft part 
um, a, a lot more guidance than these policies and procedures, which then become brittle, and they they're not they're not strength uh, they're not uh, useful enough to be able to adapt and flexible enough to adapt to the conditions that that are caused by these shocks and stresses. That's the that's the key message that I think I have to bring to to software architects and senior developers in, in the software industry is that we tend to look upon these brittle software structures that we that we build. Um, and we don't realize that that the complexity doesn't exist in those soft uh, in these in these brittle software structures, which are hardwired and highly constrained. Essentially, software is a complicated system. To use Dave Snowden's nomenclature, it's not it's not complex. It's complicated, and we put these rigid, complicated things into systems, and then get surprised when the system changes and they bend and warp and twist and crack. Um, and what we need to do is to the people who design these hard the, these hard structures, and that can be software structures or business structures. Need to understand this moving mass of, of flesh and ideas that's going to warp and destroy everything that that you think is predictable and solid and and true um, and that's the reality that we have to live in now and, and with covid i think people are saying that that's very much the, the right way think, to, to look at the world i think we keep talking about covid and we should because it's important but you know what covid is not the first crisis that we've had like crisis we've had a few others I remember the financial one, I'm quite old. But also, COVID wasn't really a surprise. It wasn't a genuine black swan. In many, many senses, it was a grey rhino. COVID, we, we didn't know it was COVID that was coming until January, and then it was obvious, but we didn't do anything to the summer in our organisations by and large. We waited until we had to. But actually, um, if you go back, I think the cover of Time magazine early in 2017 said we weren't ready for the next pandemic. So we knew something nasty outside our experience was coming, but we weren't anti-fragile enough because we, 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 we weren't even prepared. We weren't even thinking about a change in the status quo. We, were, we had this false assumption of stability, of continuity, because we happened to be in a period which was relatively calm. It's a bit like Euclidean geometry developing because the people thinking about it were on the Nile Delta and it was flat. The world wasn't flat, but we ended up with Euclidean geometry because of it. Now, it's very useful, but it doesn't actually describe the phenomena of our world very well because it came out of a very limited mindset. So this is mindset stuff and mindset goes with culture. Uh, there's something that uh, that's a comment from uh, Matthew Jackson. Uh, I like his uh, terminology. He says, traditional organizations don't understand how to enable stress inoculation, uh, value failure, to bring into the environment a known risk. And, and, and that's actually coming to that thought that you were saying, Tony, that this COVID-19 is not the only pandemic. We've been through quite a bit. So how do you prepare an organization? especially a traditional one, to almost find a, a vaccine, as it were, that it can inject into the organization and help them. Um, <laughs> but is there can I say, you're absolutely right, but can I say, I'm writing another book now. I, the crisis has inspired me, as bad as that is. So I'm writing a book on managing through a global crisis and the failures of risk management that have gone with it. And... I've got five fundamentals about global crisis, one of which is there's going to be another one. In fact, there'll be a lot. And the next one of which is it won't be the same as this one, which is very, very obvious. So the stability we've got here is not the assumed stability. We are very good with risk management at cutting off, dealing with the realized hazard that's happened. So we'll, we'll deal with this one moderately well. After the financial crisis, we didn't properly entirely deal with all the issues of the financial crisis, but we, we improved a bit. The anti-fragile organization is an organization pursuing anti-fragility in order that it will not be surprised, it will take in its stride the next crisis and the next everything. And it's not really just, I like inoculation, that's good, but inoculation isn't enough. We can stress test our organizations in all kinds of ways, but the stress that will come along will not be one of the ones we've inoculated it against. That's pretty certain. But what you get from being exposed to lots of challenge of that nature 
is an ability and a readiness and a preparedness. And that does include systems and it does include culture and it does include the development of your people to do that. Some people will argue that we already have a mechanism for that in the organization, that being risk management. Oh dear. <laughs> but but I'm, I'm giving you a cue, Tony, to actually... Thank you for the cue. So I would say well, on that note... We're missing it, you. yes. <laughs> so the trouble with risk management, even the ISO standard, it's good, it's helped us. Risk management has been really productive. It's helped us a lot, but it's also an enormous failure. The trouble with risk management is if you can't conceive of a risk, it's not in your risk register. And if it's not in your risk register, you can't manage it. So the trouble with risk management fundamentally is it's flawed. But as well as that, we treat all the risks as if they're static and we don't pay special attention to systemic risks. Now, COVID or the financial crisis are systemic risks. They're not instant. They take time to emerge and develop, however short. And when they do happen, everything falls over. It's a domino effect. And treating that as if it's a static risk is you're going to fail. And almost every organization in the world not only has a risk register with static risks in and no systemic risks, but also at best maybe reviews their risk register four times a year. Even the best financial institutions don't do much more than that. Now, it, four times a year, three months, look what's happened with COVID in three months. The risks have completely changed. We cannot carry on behaving as if we're in a, a period like the, maybe the 1980s. We need to grow up and wake up to the environment we're in. We are hyper interconnected. Now, prices are instant. They're going to get faster. Yeah, and I think there's a structural, uh, the other structural problem that I see, Tony, is that typically when you talk about an enterprise and organization, and Barry probably relates to this as well within systems, is that it's, it's very much the boundaries and you work internally. Um, you know, the concept of ecosystems and environments around it is something that we typically don't factor into the type of work and design that we're looking at. And in actual fact, that is part, part of the problem because we're really blinded in, in what we're, we're really focusing, where the risk originates from. And that's back to the poverty of language, isn't it? Because classically, an architect in the physical sense builds a building with certain assumptions, which is presumably that we're not going to see fundamental change in the world. That if we're in an area which has no seismic risk, we're not suddenly going to have a seismic risk for example. So we have lots of implicit assumptions and we run our businesses on lots of implicit assumptions. The chief exec and the C-suite have to learn to challenge everything they take for granted constantly. Yeah. But, but that's what I love about the, the, the way the digital work world is actually working both, both as a business, as a growing network of businesses, a, a different model is because you're forced to deal with those more complex interconnections uh, rather than just the internal pieces of your system, your organization. Um, and, and that to me is the fascinating part where if you do, if organizations do start tackling that agenda as part of what they might call their digital transformation, it might expose them to a, a wider view that allows them to challenge assumptions and actually look at things that they wouldn't have previously. So system thinking does give us a language for that, a very good language. It helps us look at the bigger, the big picture. It helps us go out into the ecosystem and go out beyond that. And it's something we have to do, obviously, at all times. We have to look at the ecosystem. We have to be constantly challenging. If we don't, we're setting ourselves up now to fail. Now, it's, it's interesting how it's taken so long for the sort of anti-fragility message to really develop from Talib's book, because so many people have been puzzling over it for such a long time. To make it practical, we need a change of behavior at the top of our organizations. We need a change in view. We need a change in mental model. We need to look broader and outwards and be constantly aware. And we not to take for granted anything. 
you know, I, th I think that that, that 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 message is captured very well in the work of Ralph CSC after the big crisis, which was the financial crisis, about the, the dominant discourse of management and the way that we see the world as ordered and structured and our belief that we are actually somehow, because we're, because we're in executive positions, we're in control of this world around us. Um, and stepping away from that and understanding that these truths, this connection to the ecosystem isn't something outside, external or far away. It's inside. It's in the narratives of the people working and doing the real work and buying your products and building your products. In those narratives, we, ha uh, we, ha we can capture the truths of what's actually happening and get a better picture of the ecosystem instead of ignoring the narratives and drawing little lines and boxes in, in a PowerPoint, which is the way my industry solves problems today. But Barry, I mean, yeah. you're absolutely right that we know about it but you're still in the position where we're not doing it. We have fragile organizations because they don't know they're fragile. Yeah. And, and the, the dominant discourse, what they've been taught at business school has taught them to be blind to the fact that they're fragile as well, which is very, very, very difficult to get that stone rolling. As a former business school academic, I take some of the time. It's quite interesting the way we, 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 we basically deconstruct business in the business school. It's the same problem as we're talking about actually with everything about the organization. It's all based on deconstruction. We don't look at the holistic whole. Anti-fragility gives us a holistic approach to the organization. We've never had that in the business school. One, one doesn't. Claims, control, finances at the top, strategies at the top. None, none of them are. What one doesn't realize how in de how deep and systemic that, 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 uh, structural uh, thing that you're talking about, Tony, is in, inherent in what, what we have all around us. Because in the 20th century, you know, the whole philosophy around uh, modernism from Central Europe was to really embrace life between man and machine. So the British arts and crafts movement wanted to retain uh, the crafts because machines were being used to create creative imitations. And this whole adoption of this trying to balance man and machine. And here we are in the 21st century, that's still our preoccupation, the underlying philosophy of the systems, when we should be thinking about balancing man between man and nature, for instance, given what's, what's happening. Um, but but we're st the whole business paradigm, the whole modernism of we what we have in that structure is still based on that. So as Barry says, the, the way we design and model and abstract and decompose, deal with complexity is still inherent in that. It's, it's a hard sell not just from, from coaching, selling, advising, or consulting, purely from what you're saying in terms of adapting and doing is, is a huge, is going to be a huge effort because that is an, a very entrenched and strong mindset that you're working yeah. against. It's, it's got lots of implications, obviously. But I think one of the interesting implications, it tells us that efficiency is not necessarily good, which is a rather strange idea. But you see, efficient systems, hyper-efficient systems are fragile. It's a classic example that Talibor was used. Heathrow Airport is another one. If you've only got five minutes for a slot, anything that goes wrong in that schedule and the whole system falls over. So we have a lot of things to learn which are wrong with our approach and our model, and we need a new mindset to do that. We need an anti-fragile mindset. <laughs> yeah. After, after this exchange, uh... Thank you very much. I, I, I am tempted to to uh, go back to the room with my, my customer who asked me about the anti-fragility and make a comparison to our COVID times we live, you know, say, but we will never have a vaccine for anti-fragility as <laughs> for COVID. <laughs> and meanwhile, we need to develop some habits like during COVID, like washing hands. What habits, more precisely, can I tell you to my to my customer about to be more and more concrete? Okay, no vaccine, but habit like washing hands. What do you advise? So, <laughs> so I would say we need precautionary principles. Washing your hands is a good one because whatever the infection is or however COVID works, generally hygiene is going to be a good idea as a protection. Similarly, skin in the game. As Talib has talked about, it's a very good cautionary principle for your board. They need to have some ownership in the company, then there won't be so risk, uh, so up for risk, perhaps, to the same extent. 
putting waste in the ground is probably not a good idea, even if you're pretty sure about the geology, it's probably something you want to avoid. We need precautionary principles in our organisations. That's one of the ways we have to reinvent risk management as well. I think that if you were to apply my work and a residual analysis to um, to COVID, you would say this, that the, that the future your ability to survive this stressor is not about how you adapt to it when it turns up it's about what you've done in the past and people who've eaten well taken care of their health wash their hands generally are financially stable enough to sit at home have have some savings and have a buffer they're the people who are going to ride this out they're anti-fragile to covid because they've done the residual analysis they've built the residues and they know i don't know what's going to hit me but when something does hit me i'm going to have some stuff left over to, to take the next step with I think that the, the one thing also for me is that uh, you need to think of businesses and enterprises, living organisms within, within as uh, I'm, I'm taking this from stealing it from Tony, but it's, it's living organisms within ecosystems of organisms. And, and then when you start training people in your organizations to, to cope with it, it's not necessarily a vaccine, but the ability to model the natural systems to actually find ways like these collective organisms that actually simplify find ways to actually use your generative and ability to thrive under destructive under destructive conditions to actually thrive you know plan out those scenarios then when shocks do happen you're almost like ingrained, ingrained with the principles to cope even though you don't know what those shocks are because inherently you're starting to deal with something that's more intrinsic the, the very principles of being regenerative self-healing uh dealing with exceptions dealing with unknowns and anti-fragility does give us a clear view of the decomposition in the way we've done things is bad. I mean, my body, I could yeah. separate my heart, my lungs, etc. My ability to withstand things is much better because I'm a complete system. And it's not just me. You see, a meadow, any natural system can regenerate itself um, and to some extent can reproduce. There's a whole host of things we can learn by studying natural systems rather than focusing on man-made structures as we have done. Organizations are a mixture of man-made systems with hardwired features and relatively little connectivity with the outside ecosystem and natural systems, you've got all the people in them and the way they operate informally as well as formally. We need to take account of organizations as being in this space overlapping natural and man-made systems and we need to give a lot more attention to the natural part of them uh, that doesn't mean we can't use a lot of the techniques we've used to date but we need to use them much more um, intelligently and much more carefully i would suggest than we have done I'll give you an example lean one way of making your processes lean is to automate them but automation is very fragile another way is to multi-skill your people do it like the Japanese, uh, use tag time, have people able to do all kinds of things within their three minute tag time cycle time, basically, and allow them to operate and come up with improvements on that. There are lots of things we can do to move away from this hardwired view of the world, whether it's our systems or actually things like conveyor systems of production. Well, I'm so sorry to say we are running out of time. And I'm very happy that uh, when we prepare this uh, 40 minutes talk, we prepare it during one hour and a half and we talk about something new. <laughs> so it's awesome having you gentlemen. And I think there is a very nice trio I would love to see again. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for your idea and your insight. And uh, we invite all our viewers to wait a bit to connect to the next panel about harnessing a certain a certain team. Thank you, everybody. Thank Hope you. Again. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.
David! <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so hello everyone. Yeah, hello. Hello. Hi people. Good evening. Good evening. Long day then. Indeed. Yes. Fascinating day. Yeah. Yeah, do you you just had an interesting session, Martin? Oh, you know. It could easily have gone on for two hours. Yeah. But, yeah. Good. So it, every, everyone can see and hear us. So seeing as we're off, we're we're missing Alan. I've just sent an email to Alan. I'm hoping he'll be joining us shortly. Um, one of the things that in this panel I'd, I'd like us to you know, look at focusing on is the idea of focusing on harnessing uncertainty. And a lot of the stuff we've been talking about up to now, I think, and, and look, looking through the various streams, um, have been looking at reactions and issues and whatever. Uh, but Thoreau said it, it's not a question of what you look at, it's a question of what you see. And knowing the, the four of you as I do, and there is an area here where what's going on represents huge opportunity for us. So it's going beyond you know, one of the topics of the, the conference here, going beyond resilience to anti-fragility, uh, just to actually look at that and start to pick that up and, and, and talk on that. So before we do, I'll go from the top of the screen downwards. And can you just take two minutes to introduce yourselves, what you do, your relationship to harnessing uncertainty, and we'll start with you, Steve. Uh, okay, um, so my name's Steve Down. I'm here in the UK. Um, I started life out as a physicist, um, making holograms, worked in industry for 23 years, moved on from the science to uh, managing a group and leadership. Six years ago, all that changed, uh, and I uh, took a course in coaching. Now I work as an independent uh, coach, uh, but I like to think there's more uh, to life than just coaching. So I'm also interested in um, the environment, the systems, uh, things called constellations that go around coaching, um, leadership, um, relationships. And um, so my own relationship with uncertainty uh, has been very personal in that I went from a big corporate to being self-employed and sort of not knowing what the future would hold. And um, in, in my hobby, I, I ride a horse and I started off with a young horse, never done it before. And so that could be very uncertain. So I, I've gotten used to dealing with all types of uncertainty on different levels. And, and now my goal is to share what I've learned with other people and, and help them where I can. It's me. Wonderful. Thanks, Steve. Jeff. Uh, hi, Richard, and hi, everyone. Uh, so uh, Je Jeff from Limerick in Ireland, um, and I suppose by way of background, I have spent virtually all of my 30-year-plus career working in some aspect of the agricultural supply chain, uh, from the, the field and the floor to the, uh, to the level of um, director, CEO, across a variety of organizations and areas from forestry, dairying, education, waste management, biofuels, farm veterinary. And um, yeah, so a rich, rich range of experience in that space. Uh, by way of a background in terms of education, uh, environmental science, uh, business, finance, and then more recently got interested in coaching as well, like Steve and uh, culture transformation and, th and those types of area. Um, in terms of my interest in this area of um, harnessing uncertainty, a lot of the work that I see myself doing just at the moment involves working with organizations as they mediate a way forward. And, and, and the mediation can be characterized, if you like, um, as, as exploring a tension between a, a desire for certainty versus the reality of uncertainty. Um, and it is in that context that a future needs to be mediated, if you like. And what I've noticed is that there is there is the potential for a beautiful creative tension between that 
um, you know, the desire for certainty and the reality for uncertainty. And that's there. And I think, and I think that's a very rich ground. And I think that's, for me, how I would um, look at or appreciate the value of harnessing un un uncertainty. I think there is a shadow side to it as well. And that tension can sometimes, between certainty and uncertainty, can sometimes reveal itself as, if you like, an emotional or a political quagmire and also an energy drain. Um, you know, particularly when it rests, if you like, maybe slightly at the subconscious level and not fully acknowledged. So there's opportunity, um, but there's also challenge. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. And David. Lovely. Thank you, Richard. And lovely to see you. Lovely to see the whole panel. Um, uh, David McLean, I'm originally from Scotland and I now live in England and the UK as well. Um, a former Royal Marine, uh, although as I said to Richard before, it seems to get more and more distant. That So really my life uh, and the purpose, etc. of who I am, really starting in the last 10 years in terms of um, retraining as a psychotherapist working helping people to create lasting positive change um through private health care training lecturing etc now i've been running various businesses now for the last 10 years uh, in the corporate space as well really helping to create change and i suppose actually to answer to start answer a question already to, to start to harness the uncertainty to st or start to help people to deal with the uncertainty that they are dealing with sorry um my personal journey has, has taken me to this point as well. The, the study that I have done through neuroscience, various aspects of psychology, uh, metaphysics, um, theology, particularly the Eastern side and, and, and Chinese philosophy, has really got me to the point now to understand that I believe that we're all kind of going in the same direction. I believe that we all have different ways to get there, whatever it may well be, whether it's Buddhism or, scientist or science. Um, but I believe that we can now come together that what's going on in, in, in a global society that we can come together now and start to really find a common place find a common ground in terms of what um the uncertainty is as an individual and uncertainty is as a, as a whole and um look to support each other and move forward yeah, thank you very good and and martin last but not least um, I'm Martin Knox. Um, I have a one-liner for what I do. I work with leaders and their organisations to help them find, articulate and deliver their truth. I come from a design background and I'm nosy. I want to know and find out about every aspect of the person and the organisation that I'm, 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 I'm dealing with. Um, if you want to find out more, mnox.co.uk. My relationship with certainty is there ain't no certainty. There's no such thing. There cannot be. How can there possibly be certainty? So uncertainty is, 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 is you know, part of the order of the universe. My, my experience or, or, or an experience of my relationship with certainty was um, I came off a motorbike a year ago and as I, as I was sliding up, sliding along the road um, there was absolutely no certainty and I was certain of something I was I, I absolute certainty that I was going to, that, that I was safe um, where does it exist is my question where is certainty so on that note I'll shut up okay thank you so I think it was Voltaire who said that uncertainty is very uncomfortable and certainty is absurd. Uh, so in the work that you're doing and what you've noticed today, if there was a, if you had a magic wand, what you, would you wish that it was pe people were taking notice of as against what you think they're currently taking notice of? Who wants to, who wants to lead? Go on then, Martin. I'd say themselves, you know, we've been encouraged uh, since, since, since the war, you know, in this, this consumer society um, to, be, to be concerned about the external, you know, what do people think of us? What, you know, what's the next thing? Um, we need to be aware of ourselves primarily. 
I'll offer a thought on that, uh, Richard. And, and it's building up what Martin said, and I noticed uh, that Martin described himself as nosy, and uh, which I think is. You, but there's something beautiful in that um, because if there's if if I had the magic wand, I would be I'd be looking for more nosiness and, and to use another word, perhaps more curiosity. Um, uncertainty is a reality, and and I think that because it's so vast, you know, th th this uncertainty is infinite, and of course, then it's intimidating, and we want to shield ourselves from it by, I suppose, by 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 searching for the comfort of certainty. So, so there's this, you know, there's this um, this duality going on all the time. Um, so, for me, I think the opportunity is is to find the courage, the vulnerability, the time, and the space to lean into that uncertainty with curiosity. And one of the things that I'd observe is, I don't know if others would agree, but I think that when we can bring that, um, I suppose, mindset of curiosity or nosiness, it's impossible to be anxious at the same time. I don't believe that we can be curious and anxious at the same time. And, and there is value there. But I acknowledge the fear and the intimidation associated with that as well. Okay. David, you've had a lot more experience of uncertainty than, than many of us. What, what, what would you bring to this? Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely, yeah. Um, so, uh, I mean, yeah, uncertainty in terms of uh, the, the military days, there's no doubt about that. But in terms of what I believe and what I understand now, um, and, and to kind of answer the, the very first question that Martin was talking about there, I believe the most important thing is to be in the now. It's one of these kind of obvious points that everybody thinks, and it's the philosopher uh, uh, Alan Watts that said that people believe the now is a hairline on a watch. They believe the now is this second hand that just keeps on ticking around. So it's, there's not really any point being being um, interested in the now because the now is over. You know, the now is over, the now is over. It's just that hairline. But actually, all we have ever have is the now. And if we delve straight into quantum physics and, and, and in that kind of space, then actually consciousness, the now, is actually an eternal moment. And I don't mean eternal as an everlasting, I mean singular. So the now is exactly who we are. So once we actually understand who we are, the power of the now is absolutely everything because there is no future. Because when the future comes, it's the now. Uh, and of course, the past is gone. So I think it's a, a deeper understanding of what the now uh, is. And then, of course, that will relate easily to uncertainty. Because once you know who you are more uh, and you realize the power of what is in this particular moment, then, well, there's no need to be uncertain. Or there's less need to be uncertain anyway. Good. Steve? Yeah, I, I mean, I'd just like to share something. Um that our moderator from the last panel said to me at the weekend. And, and I think it's a, a positive from all this uncertainty, if you like. She said she was going into work every day and having to find new ways to be creative. So in that way, uncertainty has been the driving force for creativity. And, and so I think that, that's one of the real positives that's come out of this. And to echo a bit Jeff's point, um, one of the things we can do is to create that space for people to be creative. Very good. One of the, um, I, did, I can't remember who it was now, I mentioned duality earlier. And Alan Moore, who is, I'm hoping will still join us here, I know, I know he's in the waiting room, waiting to be let in, has a, has a, a, has a set of called Beautiful Business. And it's a wonderful duality because I can't remember, I must have written hundreds of business plans over my life. And I can't remember too many of them that included the word beautiful in it. And I think when we're getting into what we can look for in any situation, not just business, is the beauty in it. What is it that, what is it that we're doing? What is it that we might do? That would make whatever situation we're in more beautiful. How would it add the world? Thoughts on that? Somebody could, Martin, you lead. Come on. I'd just like to finish off on the last point because David raised, and, and Steve raised a really, really important issue. You know, what is uncertainty? Uncertainty is not knowing. Getting to a point of knowing, um, there's knowing and there's not knowing. 
And then there's a point in between, and the point in between is the present. You know, and, and this leads on to your point, Richard, you're talking about a duality. We don't live in a binary existence. You know, we live in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, uh, in an existence um, that is you know, a quantum existence, where there's, there's, there's a point in between, and we live it every single moment of the day. It's because it's that place between yesterday and tomorrow. It's that place between it, the in-breath and the out-breath. It's that place where everything happens. Um, that liminal space. And we've lost sight of it. And we're getting it back, as David was saying. So, beautiful business. Very good. Um, yeah, beautiful business. Of course... You know, this is oh, fundamental and key to our existence. How we perceive beauty, you know, it's 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 in here, it's in it's in there. Um, oh, is Alan? Hello. Um, you know, how we perceive beauty. It's a really, really personal, human, you know, truly human. Um, experience, individual experience. Um, yeah, I'm going off on one. Okay, so let me let let, let me bring Alan in. Alan, hello. Sorry, sorry, sorry you're late in. Um, but we've we've sort of been talking based on your work. So, do you just want to sort of join us and give us a couple of minutes about who you are and what you're doing and. Talk to us about beautiful for a minute. You'll do it much better than I do. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. Well, so I've, I've been uh, stomping around different chat rooms, it seems, or uh, uh, conversations. So I'm sorry I'm late. I apologize. Uh, I did my best. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so I've been thinking about beauty since about uh 2016 when in fact probably it's it's longer than that um for me the idea is is that um rather than it being a sense about aesthetics uh you can sort of thinking on, on, on what um, martin was saying that you can bring the good into the world um and it's a kind of very connective um, idea, if we embrace it properly, that re reconnects us to ourselves, it reconnects us to other people, uh, it reconnects us to our communities, it reconnects us to the land, it reconnects us to thinking ethically about how we can be in this world. Um, and I've sort of come to the conclusion that it's a universal language only because of the experience I've had through the writing that I've done and the work that I've done. Um, it can feel very provocative, I think, for some people. But I suppose the, the one thing I really want to say is beauty is something that we need to reclaim for everybody um, and if we could base our lives uh, and our working lives and our living lives whatever lives that the multiplicity of lives that we have based on the idea of beauty um, we've got so much more potential that we can bring to this world um, can I ask, a, can I ask a, quick, a quick question Alex? yeah uh, with, with we're talking about harnessing uncertainty. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear your view on that relative to what you've just been saying. I think there's something really, really powerful in beauty, in our concept of beauty. Well, relative to, to the question. Yeah, so, yeah, so again, apologies, I'm late. I tried to get in. Um, yeah, <laughs> but it's a, uh, I think the uh you you've all talked about presence and um to be present 
it's the hardest thing that we can ever do is to be fully present um it's a kind of a cliche in a way um but a cliche always carries the dna of truth uh in many respects i think that we as a humanity have always lived in a veil of tears um it's just for us white people um we've just not experienced the level of suffering or pain that perhaps other places have over a, a long period of time and it, in those moments of great unsolved i think uh and, and of course I mean, through covid so to be absolutely honest you know i've had good days and bad days um there's days i felt immensely hopeful there's days i felt immensely overwhelmed under pressure um where does this all go one of the things that i've reflected on is uh where i am now is not the place i ever imagined i would be in uh, all the places I've ever arrived at, I've never imagined that they would be the places I would go to um, or even would want to stay longer uh, as a consequence of that. Uh, and it requires immense courage, extraordinary courage to be really present. But it's the only place that we can make the choices of what our future looks like um even though we don't know what it will be um so we have to i think i think we have to whatever comes to us on a daily basis when we have the capacity of of grace compassion and empathy which i think are kind of, sort of fundamentals of being beautiful as a human being anyway you have the ability to find a different type of resilience to absorb that experience um that reality and accept it for what it is um mm -hmm even when it even when it's really unpleasant and yeah, yeah. Alan, what, what, yeah sorry, sorry to interrupt but, but could it be that, that um you know what beauty is is our acceptance of other you know our, 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 our deep down fundamental acceptance of 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 a different another situation yeah i mean i i agree with you i think that um so the the guy that uh founded um just as a slightly tangential uh story but i think it's very relevant to your question martin is morio yoshiba who invented aikido um you know developed a martial art which could protect the person from being attacked but actually would actually protect the person from hurting themselves as you defended yourself against that that aggressor and I think the bit that's really important to your question is he saw that as a way of, of reunifying all the forces of the universe. You know, we're made of the good and the bad. And what we tend to do as human beings is we separate the two things. And, you know, I'm as guilty as everybody else in this, maybe more guilty. Um, but the fact is that we're made of the light and the dark and we have these ex expectations that we have in life of what we want to be or how things are going to work out or whatever and of course we're in a you know uh the english term is a bugger's muddle at the moment um having the ability to step back from all of that and say this is just what is happening and i have to accept it for what it is um not to see it as loss or gain but the reality is actually how we're able to move in a very different way um so so, so 
Sorry, Anne. So it's a kind of reconciliation. I mean, I find a change in me that I'm, I'm, I, I have a reconciliation between the light and the dark, the good and the bad, and the potentials. Um, I just wonder what, what, what others, you know, Steve or Jeff. I think there's a, just let me throw a, a thought in listening to you. Um, which is that uncertainty, I think, is often easier to deal with if we make it external to ourselves. Because then we've got somebody to blame. Now, the, the, the resident place of uncertainty, I think, is, is, is actually within ourselves. If we can resolve, or if we, if we can sit in uncertainty within ourselves, everything else follows. Mm. I think it's that, it's that thing about locus of control. Mm. You know, it's either, either it's happening inside us and we've got some agency with it, or it's happening outside of us and we don't and we're victim to it. So and I think at the moment there may be something about that. And that's where you lose the beauty yeah. when you externalise it. Mm. David, what's your take? There, um, it's victimisation is what we're talking about there. And uh, we are in complete control of ourselves, 100%. There only is one reality and it's now. Everything else is a figment of our imagination. There is only this particular moment. And and yes, we can get lost in our mind. Less we can, yes, we can lose awareness. But there is only this particular moment. That's, that's all there ever is. And, and um, to give your power away, I believe, to circumstances uh, is is wrong. You know, you need to. You, we need to be able to understand what what the nature is. We need to understand the power of nature, the, the power of the universe, the power of who you are, the worthiness you have, the belief levels um, that, that we that we should have. To be able to understand that we can be, do, or have what we want to be, that we can create. We are the creators of our own reality. We determine what we want and what comes into our life. Not always easy to accept to begin with, but. Uh, it's it's completely it's it's, it's the it's the only way it's the truth and um, going back on the, the beauty I think that the fundamental aspects of who we all are is beauty is love one of my mentors says that we're all liquid love and I, I really like that statement uh, and that we are pure joy that's exactly who we are so when you think when you would not involve that in business it would be absolutely crazy and that's why Alan's onto something. <laughs> I mean, it's the most natural, normal thing to do. It should be. And um, whatever our identity is, whether we're a boss, an entrepreneur, an employee, a mother, a father, a sister, whatever the psychological identity that we're taking on, the basis of everything is beauty, love, joy, ease, contentment, you know, knowing, uh, etc. So if we, if we take that as a foundation, we can implement it in everything, certainly including business. Um, What's the... Uh What's the view from Ireland? Um, you, you know, just, just, just following the thread of the conversation, I did start to think with, with, with an observation of the, the numerous business plans that you have uh, been involved in, uh, Richard. And, and, and what strikes me is that, you know, that in terms of your traditional business plan, you know, which is based on, a, you, you know, a projection of the future, and, um, and, and, and and I suppose it's predicated on a sense of certainty um, about what the organization can control and, and, and then the intention, if you like, to coerce that plan onto whatever emerges in reality. And, and, and of course, you, you know, in general, that doesn't work. And what I find intriguing is that, um, you know, the purpose of the business plan, if you like, is to close the strategic gap. And the strategic gap being where the organization is versus where the organization wants to go. So there's a tension around that. And then on the other hand, you have the reality of uncertainty. And because uncertainty is infinite, the impact of uncertainty when it's seen and acknowledged and acknowledged is, all, is always to widen the strategic gap. So there's the, 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 this tension exists, and and I'm interested in, in what others think about other things in particular. But it's it's from that tension, and if you like the management of that tension, the acknowledgement of that tension, that beauty emerges. Uh, you know, that's where that's where the creativity is. That's um, you know, that's where the third way is, if you like. And, 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 and my experience is that we don't always deal with that well. We don't deal with it because we don't acknowledge it. Um, you, you know, we try to hide from it. Uh, it's too complex. 
um, you know, and we maybe live in this pretend world where we think we can actually control things. So that's my that's the view from Ireland, view from my experience. Thank you, Steve. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I've been thinking about what you've been saying, and as well as sort of who you are as a person, I think it's very important to work out where you stand in the bigger scheme of things. So I, I think that's like being a piece on a chessboard. The, the, the power of the piece is not necessarily on how it can move on you, but its relationship to the other pieces in the bigger picture. So I think in terms of sort of harnessing in uncertainty, um, I'd bring it back to one of your favorite topics, Richard, and like the, the OODA loop and observing where you are. So it's, it's taking that time out to, to recognize who you are and where you stand and then look at the options for where you can go but understand that this is a dynamic process and if you like it to a check chessboard somebody's shaking the board all the time so it, it's a constantly looking at um what's going on around and then being creative as to as to how to deal with it so um that's my thoughts on it it's, it's where where things fit in a bigger picture it's interesting, isn't it? Because when when you look at this, the uncertainty is a very is a very vibrant place. Because the people who are sitting in certainty, whether that's the traditional taxi firms taken out by Uber, um, or whether it's the energy technology being totally disrupted by Elon Musk, they were actually sitting comfortably in certainty mm. in terms of what they saw themselves. Back to the point of willful blindness, really. Uh, so there is part of this that whilst it's uncomfortable, the uncertainty is a gift. Absolutely. So, it's a gift. Well, yeah, there's a kind and, of complacency in, in, in certainty. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's a kind of complacency in certainty, which has got to where we yeah. are now. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, sorry, I, I interrupted Richard, but there's, there's an interesting yeah. question that's come up from Nancy Kress. Um, what are your thoughts on beauty? And pattern uncertainty. Beauty, pattern uncertainty. But a very interesting question. Alan, do you want to <laughs> pick that up? Are you happy to pick that up? Yeah, I'm happy to. Um... You've been put on the spot, Alan. <laughs> I have. I'm thinking about it. Um, well, of course, uh, well, of course, um, that's a bad start. Um, in, in the work that I've done, uh, when we think about uh, the cosmos and the universe and uh, the way that we would describe it um, in terms of its patterning, uh, <clears throat> there is actually an incredible beauty in the way that the universe organizes itself and it has a pattern. Um, which I think is very interesting. And there are many, many physicists uh, and biologists, uh, naturalists that have, have described that. And so to me, uh, part of the, my response is um, a very a very simple way of saying that there is this incredible depth to how we connect to the world um, in a in a in a beautiful way. Um, the other part of it is, is uncertainty. So the world we would describe, or we'd like to describe as humans, is chaotic. Um, and again, I think I would say that we just have to find a way where we are able to find a, a different level of consciousness and a, or ability um thinking about our our friend from ireland sort of talking about you know we need to make this plan and this plan's going to work and it's this this and how do we move from there to there um which is a very human human way i think of dealing with the universe um and we've got to 
we've got to find a different way, which I think actually we do as all human beings. Every day we wake up, there will be something that happens to us, yes. whether it's in our personal lives or whether yes. it's in our business lives or whatever, where it's just like, well, that was a curveball. Let's just use that as a cliche. How do you respond to that? Mm. Um, my reflection on that is the way that you do that is you step back um, for a period of time. And it may be five seconds. It may be an hour. Uh, it could be a day. <clears throat> it might even be three days. Um, where you think about in the experience you've had in what we would call uncertainty, that was something that has caused me doubt or has challenged me as a human being. Um, how do I respond? I would say that we always have to respond with grace and we should always respond with compassion. And Very I'm good. talking to myself here, not to anybody else. Um, and it, may, and it may, re, may require us to really look very deeply within ourselves in terms of how do I give back to the world uh, where the, what has come into me is uh, something which is incoming, unexpected, chaotic, destructive, uh, whatever. But I have a choice every time in terms of how I would respond to that experience. And yeah, the and the so challenge challenges is to give back love or yeah. to contribute rather than actually to extract, which is actually would be something would be a response in anger or a response um, that would be I don't know inappropriate for want of a better uh, term. Yeah, so I, I've could. rambled a little bit there, but I, I hope that's uh, useful. Oh, I think it's very. Good. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm just conscious we've got about three minutes left. Yeah. So before we go back to when we finish this, if we go back to stream one and then we can join everybody else um, for the, 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 the next session. Um, just in the few minutes remaining. A one breath, a one breath thought for the people listening to this to give them something to think about in dealing with uncertainty in terms of that ability to harness uncertainty as against be threatened by it. Can I go first? You can. I've got a very simple, a very simple. Acknowledge and embrace uncertainty. Yeah. Because it's all there is. Yeah. Mm. Thanks, Steve. Um, I, I would say um, trust. I mean, trust people, trust things that will be happen. And what I've noticed at the moment is lack of trust seems to be driving up uncertainty that so i think mm. we need to trust in the people we're dealing with um to to help our confidence levels grow very good thank you and, and david um take these two words belief and worthiness and study them um take time to understand what belief is what limiting beliefs is what is fear why are you not believing what you should be believing and why do you not believe that you're worthy enough to get whatever it is that you may well deserve? Um, that's me. Thank you. And Jeff? Um, in listening to this conversation, I'm reminded of my identity as a farmer and my farming background. And there's something in farming that I think we can learn from. And typically, you know, my father being one and, and you know, the, the, the countryside that I grew up in, farmers will think of the next generation. But they'll only plan one day ahead. And I think there's something in that um, mm -hmm. that we can learn from. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Which to is... sign off, Alan, as we come up to the, the 10 minutes. Uh, um... I think Jess really captured my imagination there. Uh, what a beautiful thing to say. Um... Yeah. Then that will do. Yes. Richard, you have very good. Richard, you haven't um, done your sign off. So what have you got to say for yourself? I think that the, the, the thing that said, the thing that really strikes me here is, firstly, that it's internal. Our relationship with uncertainty is a personal one. Everything, everything, everything that we see about the way that it manifests outside of us 
even external, and we can be captured by that. And I think it's that moment of stillness, which, whichever way we want to relate to it, to just, to just take a deep breath and actually look at what's really there as against what we see. To actually look at it long enough to see what you wouldn't normally notice. And with that, we're on the 10 minutes. So I'll ask you to go back to stream one. And thank you very much. Have a good rest of your day. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye there. Bye now.